Good evening and welcome to the first episode of the Orthodoxy, Autocracy and Nationality series. This is our first episode on ancient Greece from the Bronze Age to Pyrrhus of Epirus. I am very lucky to be joined as always by Columba. Hello. Hello, everyone. And by Marcus. Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing? Good. I mean, the weather has been despicably grim up here, but apart from that, I've been um, reading my Plutarch again for this. It's been fun. Oh, wonderful. No, the and, weather down uh, it's been awful. And the, and the winter in Australia has been uh, rather pleasant, so I can't complain either. Hmm. <laughs> So um, in terms of a structure for the, the audience this evening, um, we're not going to go over the entirety of Greece of antiquity. We're going to start off with the, um, the ethnic and civilizational origins, the, the etymology, etc. And then we're going to um, hopefully give a sort of broad overview of the chronology and um, hopefully an interesting overview regarding ancient Greek civilization that will carry us forward through the next um, you know, 20 or something episodes of this series. And we'll end around the um, the death of Alexander the Great and the the wars of the Diadochi, if everyone's okay with that. Perfect. Wonderful. So I'll start off with the um, the etymology. Now, this is something quite interesting to consider. The Greeks never refer to themselves as Greeks. Rather, they refer to themselves as the um, Hellenists. And the region that roughly corresponds to modern-day Greece is, of course, Hellas. And um, this is, you know, quite an interesting backstory. I'm sure both of you are familiar of um, the biblical Jacob or Israel. Well, in Greek, of course, the father of the nation isn't, you know, the, the female Helen, but rather the male Helen, who is the grandson of Prometheus and Pandora. Prometheus, of course, being the um, the Greek Titan who brings the, the fire of inspiration down in defiance of Zeus and Pandora, of course, being you could almost say the Greek equivalent of Eve. And Helen is the um, father progenitor of the tribes of Greece. So of his son Doris, we have the Dorians. Of Zephus, we have his two sons, um, through which we get um, the Achaeans and the Ionians. And through Aeolus, we get the Aeolian, Aeolians. So very similar to Jacob as the progenitor of the tw uh, 12 tribes of Israel. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in terms yes. of like, a, like an origin for this term, um, the antonym is actually sort of derived from Homer. So, you know, the beginning of the archaic age around the um, the 8th century BC. And um, the term Ionian in particular was probably the most common appellation of other people who weren't um, the Hellenes referring to the, um, the Greeks. Because again, the Ionians heralded from Anatolia and most of the countries, of course, civilized countries, so to speak, were to the east of Greece. And so they would have contacted the Greeks principally through the Ionian. So Ionian also became a, um, a common usage of Greek. In terms of the actual word Greek, the English Greek is of Latin origin, as the Romans referred to the Hellenes as the Greci, and Greece as Grecia. And um, in terms of like where this term comes from, it, it's quite interesting. One theory is that um, Aristotle coined it to refer to a particular group of people residing to the west of the Hellenes, um, in particular, Epirus. So why do the Romans use the term Greeks? Because if they were also ascribed to the Epirus, of course, Pyrrhus of Epirus is the um, first major sort of military um, general to confront you know, the Greek world and the Roman world. And so that experience, the legacy of the Pyrrhic Wars, is actually where we get the term Greek. Yeah, and there's also a history of the Greeks on the Italian, right? With yes. Absolutely. And, yes, yeah. absolutely. Does anyone have anything else to say on etymology before we move forward? Um, with regards to the the Hellenists, I, I, I'm I remember reading somewhere, and you know I've been reading I've been reading um, the Iliad for our upcoming Homer stream, and and, and in Homer he, he he does he use the word Hellenist at all? Because I'm pretty sure he uses it, but in a very strict sense, like only related to um, um, the Myrmidons and Achilles' men. But I, yeah. I might be wrong about that. No, I think there is a strict appellation. I think. Um, doesn't he also refer to them as the various tribes? Yes, yes. It gets, it gets quite confusing at some points. And you also have um the, what's the other term? The, the Danans or the Danaeans, yeah. which is another one. Yeah. Um, and then later we see um, um, Helena's form and then and then Greeks form. So yeah, it's um it's a very complex history, isn't it? Absolutely. With just the name. <laughs> the, just the, the other name. thing too is if you look at um you know the Iliad and the Odyssey and those early writings, the the Greeks 
have a far greater propensity to refer to themselves regionally. Actually, this is even true up until almost the Roman conquest. There are instances where they have a collective identity, obviously, and that becomes more obvious as time comes on, say, you know, with the Persian Wars or the wars against the Romans and what have you. But, um, you know, you're more inclined to see that will refer to Ithaca, they'll refer to, you know, Menelaus of Argos, they'll refer to, you know, specific Greeks mm. from specific areas regionally, mm. far more so than what they will say, oh, these are Greek people, or Elanoi, El 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 as I would call themselves, you know, Greeks from Melado. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, this, there's this sort of idea that, I guess, in some sense, the, the Trojan War was a sort of uni unifying event for the Greeks, or at least that's how they thought of it, you know? Um, Correct, yeah. yeah. And, and, and the Greeks do have, I mean, we'll obviously dig into this as we go on, but they have a couple of watershed moments where it does unify them um, quite profoundly, more than once. Yes, indeed. All right, so um, moving on from that um, brief introduction, we have, of course, the... Um, the proto origins of the um, the Greeks. Now, in terms of like like we mentioned, the the entity of the Greeks actually is um, much um, much younger than this period. But we're going to um, take this back to the um, all, all the way to fifteen to ten thousand years ago, which is when we have the first um, evidence of settlements in Greece um, during the Mesolithic period. And um, you know, for for example, in the um, the Fracti Cave, we have um, the first evidence of agriculture in Europe. In terms of sort of getting to something approaching Greek civilization, we have the Neolithic period, which um, corresponds to around nine to three thousand years ago. In terms of like the Proto-Greek language, um, it's first attested to around two and a half and two thousand years ago. As to where the Greeks themselves came from, um, the modern assumption now is that the Greeks were originally from the Pontic steppe. So, the, you know, the Don region in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, southern Ukraine, Crimea, um, northern, you know, eastern Romania, Moldavia. Yeah, and then they moved south. But of course, I mean, in terms of um, the sort of grander legacy of the Greeks, again, we 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 can take it back to the Indo-Europeans, and that's the the foundation of much of their their mythic structure is is um very similar to to um you know other peoples the germans the, the gauls etc um so so they're, they're they're part of that um that widespread as well i mean greeks and indo-european language but yeah in terms of um um the specific ethnogenesis of the greeks if you will yeah the the, the best theory is that they came down from the balkans hmm. marcus uh yeah uh i guess it's quite evident we've we talked about gaul and uh and germania in our earlier discussions and essentially i suppose we can say with the exception of a smattering of sardinians and the basque you know greeks or certainly the early greeks alongside the early italian peoples and the uh the early gauls and germans the keltoi more or less sort of originate from that steppe area um you know that proto-indian that sort of uh uh, we're trying to think of that that people that sort of moved in and brought Bronze Age technology into the steppe. Oh, they called the Yamnia. Yamnia. You know, they're sort of all yeah, yeah. sorry, yeah. That they all sort of seem derivative in some way or another the Yamnia, you know, uh, bronze culture. Yeah, but of course, um, it, it's not just them because the, the the steppe groups, as we've said many times, swept southwest from the steppe. Um, and, and and conquered the peoples who were already there. And indeed, we see um we see some lingering traces of this with you know the the, the greek stories of the pelasgians and, and groups like this you know native groups who were in greece before the greeks even came you know um so 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 the greeks were were even themselves aware that they were not the the original population um although although you know uh, it depends on who you're talking about the athenians had some had some interesting ideas on that but yes yeah. quite <laughs> Anyway, so um, again, that rather brief introduction to the to the pre-Greeks that sort of brings us on to the um, uh, the Greek Bronze Age, and now of course we have the um, Sicadic culture, which is considered to be the um, the forerunner culture to what would later be the the Mycenaean culture. But before we get to the Mycenaeans, um, we of course have the Minoans operating out of Crete. The significant thing about the Minoans, of course, is that they could probably be recognizably the first um, European civilization. And just from the island of Crete and, you know, a few adjacent islands in the Aegean, um, from the mid third century BC, mid millennia BC to around um, 1100 BC, um, we, we have records of them having, you know, multiple story buildings, say, for example, plumbing, um, in addition to, you know, elaborate frescoes, art, writing in hieroglyphics and um, 
in Proto-Greek script known as, you know, by 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 modern archaeologists as Linear A? Um, well, well, there's there's debate about whether or not Linear A is actually a Greek language because Linear A hasn't been deciphered. Oh, yet. I meant Proto-Greek, Proto-Greek, as opposed to um, these are Proto-Greek peoples as opposed to again again being greek but when it comes to the actual continuity of the greek language uh, i believe that is um primarily from phoenician but in terms of like a distinctly proto-greek with again it's the kind of like a break in continuity thanks to the bronze age collapse but um, yeah um i mean the phoenician language the phoenician script was used for the for the greek language right but if we're talking about this period here um we have linear b which was used by the mycenaeans and Linear B was deciphered um, in the 1950s by this brilliant, um, I think he had been a cryptologist in the war, um, Ventris maybe, I, I can't remember his, his name, but uh, um, yeah, he, he, he deciphered Linear B, which, you know, preserved on tablets on the Greek mainland. And, and um, it was discovered that it was, it was Greek and it was the exact same, you know, well, well um, you know, an earlier form of Greek with a totally different, um, 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 you know, la um, written language that was being used from the later Phoenician. But in terms of linear A, um, we are we are not one hundred percent sure that it, it it would that it did represent a Greek language. It could have been um, um, Semitic in origin or or what have you. And certainly, um, and if you look at the material culture of the Minoans um, in their earliest stages and when they first came to um, the height of their influence. There is a lot of um, um, Semitic and particularly Egyptian yes. uh, material culture. So, so there is there are suggestions that the the original Minoans, if you will, weren't weren't Greeks. Absolutely, and I think this is something which is interesting to draw out in terms of the Minoans almost represent their own sort of civilizational sphere, as it were, between the um, Cycladic. Um, uh, cultures in Greece at this time and the Egyptian cultures and it's possible that they were influencing both at the same time. Um, in terms of sort of what happened to them, I, I believe that um, natural disasters are often the credited response for the demise of the Minoans, um, especially the volcanic eruption of um, Santorini. Um, but I also believe that they were more or less somewhat assimilated into the Mycenaean culture by around the um, second millennium BC. Um, well, 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 there's actually, if you look at the, um, you know, and of course, when you're, when you're excavating a city, you will find multiple, you know, strata, right. Representing, you know, what one city and then another one, a couple hundred years later, and you'll be able to notice, um, you know, say a layer of ash, which would represent, you know, the city, um, burning down at some point now on Crete, um, in the second millennium, um, around, I think 1600 BC, if my memory serves correctly, we see the first, um, um, widespread destruction, you know, uh, at places like Knossos, um, which I guess was the capital, the largest settlement, um, it's burnt down and we see this in, in multiple settlements across the island. Um, but then, um, the, the, these, these settlements have a resurgence, if you will, and, and they, they bounce back even grander than before. And you have, um, you know, the palace economies that, that, that begin to, well, they'd already began to build up, but they come into their, they come into their own and this is their, the zenith of their power, if you will. Um, and then after this, we see another, um, a couple hundred years later, around 1300, 1400, we see, uh, um, BC, we see another wave of destruction. Now this wave of destruction is very interesting because we see the power shift to the coasts to certain coastal sites and we then see the presence of linear b which we know to be greek um, mm -hmm. after this phase of destruction whereas after the first phase of destruction linear a is still used and linear b isn't present so the first um the first wave of destruction some people have tried to relate to you know natural disasters and volcanic eruptions th things like this um but the second wave of destruction um, it seems almost indisputable to me that it represents a Mycenaean invasion and conquering of um, the Minoans, which mm -hmm. in fact is um, is is very likely represented in the stories um, told by the Greeks in their myths of Theseus, who of course um, um, the, the the king of Crete was uh, Minos, you know, and his son um, his son that his wife Pasiphae had, had with a bull was the Minotaur, mm -hmm. and the story goes that. Um, um, the um, Knossos, the Cretans demanded tribute in the form of ten noble youths and ten noble um, maidens from from the Greeks every year to be fed to the to the Minotaur in the labyrinth. 
um, until Theseus came along, slew the Minotaur, and um, and made away with um, 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 the king's daughter. And so there, there is a, there is an idea that this story um, in the Greek myth actually represents a real historical event: the conquering of Crete by the Greeks. Fascinating. Thank you for that, Columbo. And of course, the um, etymology of the Minoans comes from the the said king Minos. Yes. Um, and again, you're sort of covering quite a lot of things there, which is um, hints of the Bronze Age collapse. Um, again, hints of the, the the culture of the Mycenaeans. So bringing us back to the the Mycenaeans now. Um, moving from the um, the Cycladic cultures, we have the Halaldic cultures, and then Halaldic three or the Turns culture, and we have the beginning of what would considered to be the Mycenaean civilization from around 1600 BC onwards. In terms of the etymology of Mycenaean civilization, and of course, it's named after the um, the main sort of palace center in this region, which um, is in the Peloponnese, a city um, known as Mycenae. Yes, other, and I would. Sorry, I just wanted to say, just linking back to what to what we mentioned before there, um, almost immediately after, um, you know, relatively speaking, 50 years, 100 years, with a very short space of time after the um, second phase of destruction in Crete, um, we see um, a massive expansion of the site of Mycenae. And, and whereas before this, Mycenae had been, um, you know, you had found traces of, of, of Minoan material culture in Mycenae and in, in, in mainland Greece more generally. After the, 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 the conquest, if you will, of Crete, um, we see Mycenae take off as the, 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 the new center of power, you know. And um, I would also note that in the Greek myths, um, the founder of Mycenae was Theseus again. So we can see all these things coming together once more. Absolutely. So just um, moving on again from, from those points, um, it wasn't um, a Mycenaean empire. There were other palace cities um, such as Athens, Pylos, um, Eleucos, Thebes. In terms of like their architectural influence, I think we have um, evidence of um, as, as, uh, examples of a uniform Mycenaean culture existing um, you know, as far as Cyprus, as far as the Levant and modern Syria. Um, and this is sort of known as the Mycenaean Koina, or the, the common era, which was remarkable for sort of producing this um, architectural and cultural uniformity. Um, uh, you mentioned already that um, the Mycenaeans are able to um, take over Greece and the various allegorical references and the interesting historicity of um, King Minos and Theseus and the, and the Minotaur and the influence of Linear B. Um, in terms of other um, interesting features about the Mycenaeans was the fact that um, the nobility were buried in um, the Tholoi or the beehive tombs. And um, I can't help but think in terms of, you know, the Minoans being a, a somewhat of a conduit for Egyptian culture, that um, the Egyptians did have some influence on um, Mycenaean burial culture, such as um, the practice of, you know, burying certain nobility with various artifacts, weapons, etc., things that they need in the afterlife, and even examples of mummification for the high nobility. Yes, certainly. And, and this attests to the... the um the the dominant phase i mean this is this is um egypt at this point is in the new kingdom which is um its last sort of great age but also its most powerful this is the age of you know ramesses the second you know um um th this is egypt's imperial age where they're stretching out into phoenicia um they're they're they're, they're you know out into the levant um and they're extending their influence all over the mediterranean and um their their goods are being sold everywhere and you know indeed in the tombs that you mentioned in in the um in the mycenaean the tholoi that you mentioned they've actually found you know egyptian jewelry and um and all manner of all manner of artifacts that are not even um that have been directly imported from egypt and even more interestingly there are items that are um such as again jewelry mirrors um that, that are in an egyptian style or an egyptianizing style we might say but have been produced locally and so we see um egyptian fashions taking off and again um we we see this also with um sculpture i mean the 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 greeks themselves acknowledge this if you read um greek history as um people like herodotus they say that the art of sculpture came to greece from egypt you know of course it was um taken and massively improved by the Greeks, but um, they acknowledged its origin again. So yeah, um, yeah, Egypt was the dominant cultural power at this time until the collapse, which I assume we'll come to. 
we also have to appreciate too at this time because I think uh, often in the modern mind we perhaps don't appreciate the scale of trade that um that in the Mycenaean world that they did have contact in trade uh, as extensively as far as Afghanistan. Like they were importing tin from Afghanistan and from Spain via the Phoenician colonies. I mean, we're talking about a world that, even though it is quite sim- simple by our modern standards, had a, had a degree of sophistication and complexity to its own that we don't often appreciate. And that for the Mycenaean Greeks in their sort of formative stage would have been importing uh, uh, pottery and amphorae, even goods, etc., from the Hittites, from the Sumerians and later the Babylonians, from Egypt. And all of these uh, foreign influences did sort of mix in the because you look at Greece geographically, it's sort of in in this along with Italy, so it's sort of the central Mediterranean. So it was at the middle of all these influences, and they all sort of coalesced in Mycenaean Greece. Yeah, um, and, and in terms of um, if anyone's curious to see the kind of trade, because what would commonly happen is, uh, say, we had a Greek a Greek ship or a Mycenaean ship that wanted to trade, it would you know leave um, the eastern shores of the mainland, and then it would you know pass maybe go to Cyprus, get some tin from Cyprus, and then it would go down to the Levant, and then it would go to Egypt, and then it would come back around the other way to Greece, and so you would do a sort of circular trade. And um, if anyone wants to see a fantastic example. Um, um, there's a there's a wreckage. It was called the Ulubarun wreck, and it was a um, a shipwreck from this period that was discovered at, on the bottom of the Mediterranean, um, loaded off the with cargo. Turkey, I think. Yes, off the coast of off the coast of Turkey, um, the south coast of Turkey. That's and, correct. Yeah, and it, and it's loaded with um, you know metal ingots, jewelry, um, olive oil, all all manner of things. And so yeah, um, there was just there was a massive amount of trade and. We we see the 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 building up of a complex economic system in the Mediterranean um, for the first time, um, and, and it's argu- and it's arguably the uh, the collapse of this system, this sort of complex trading system, alongside other variables, which sort of contributes to the eventual collapse of the Mycenaeans as well, along with all all the other Bronze Age uh, societies too. Certainly, although um. Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, talking about the the collapse of a civilization is always difficult, right? Because it's Correct, there's yeah. there's so many different um, influences, if you will. Uh, but I was, um, yeah, I was actually gonna um, ask or drop the line about uh, sea peoples when you're talking about the Mycenaeans, but I figured that might be a uh, well, uh, I mean, I mean, it, it is my um, it is my opinion that the sea peoples refers to the Greeks, the Mycenaean Greeks. Um, and I think I think um, for for people who are a bit confused, and, and um, the pharaoh during the, the, this collapse, when this when this um, Bronze Age um, economy, this this Mediterranean economy collapsed, the pharaoh at the time was one Ramesses the third, and there is a relief um, on a, on the side of a temple which depicts um, um, Ramesses the third, you know, in his chariot with his bow. Um, smiting these 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 enemies, and it refers to um, the peoples of the sea. Um, mm-hmm. Now, now we look at that, and then we look at, um, say, Homer. And Homer at this time he's describing, you know, the the, the Trojan War and the the, um, the you know the, all of that. But we also see, you know, in, in say the Odyssey um, and, and the stories about um, the Greeks traveling, that the Greeks were everywhere. You know, that the Greeks were were all over the Mediterranean, getting up to all sorts of getting up to all sorts of chaos. And I think this is a, a reflection of this actual period. You know, because um, um Absolutely. yes, there was a lot of um, um maritime trade from the Egyptians and the Phoenicians, but really, um, in terms of a people who were so intimately connected with the sea and with sailing really the greeks are the only um options i would say at this period and there's also the matter of um if you look at the the depictions of the people the art the armor the kind of armor that they're wearing um in this egyptian relief they have sort of um crests and and horned helmets which um reflect in large part um the depictions of warriors on mycenaean vases um and also um actual mycenaean armor that has been recovered so i would argue that it is referring to the greeks who on this period uh in this period in this homeric age if you will just seem to have went on a bit of a massive bender you know <laughs> um, yeah, which i exactly. guess is pretty heroic you know and in and in a way too we also see the genesis of the uh the seafaring culture of the greeks which i mean as we proceed along along the timeline will become and will essentially remain a, a part of the Greek um, way of warfare, of Greek society, of Greek trade for 
essentially the rest of history. I mean, the, the Greeks are uh, are a people who are fond of the sea and are competent on the sea, both in warfare and with trade. Definitely, yeah. So thank you both for that. Um, in terms of, sort of moving this on, trying trying to find a thread for all this. Um, before I, I get onto the politics, because I'm, I'm I'm trying to find some sort of continuity between the um the Mycenaeans and the um the classical Greek civilization. Um, you, you mentioned that you believe there is a, some association with the Sea Peoples, the Greeks. Um, as far as I believe, there is also an assumption that the Sea People could have been the Dorians. Is, does that have any weight? Well, I mean, the Dorians are Greeks, right? Oh, absolutely. But, <laughs> I mean, but, but in terms of um, Greece. yeah, but in terms of um, 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 a specific appellation, I don't know if you can prove it beyond a certainty, but um, they, they were certainly um, coming into Greece at this time. Right. But I don't know if the Dorians would would come into Greece and make their mark there and then be able to, you know, go to Egypt and and take on the Hittites as well. So I would argue that it's referring to the Greeks more broadly. Um, but but I, I couldn't be certain. It's certainly a possibility. In fairness, we almost could require a stream on the Bronze Age collapse and the Sea Peoples on its own because it is quite a, a detailed and long, long-winded subject. You know, once you start associating, you know, with the Hittites and the Assyrians, it just goes on and on. Mm -hmm. Well, exactly. I mean, something I was going to draw is obviously I'm thinking about proximity um, on the the four sort of great Bronze Age empires at this time. Of course, you have the um, the New Kingdom of um, Egypt, you have the Assyrian Empire, you have the Hittite Empire, and you have the Mycenaean Empire. So one wonders because it's the Mycenaeans and the Hittites which fall hardest and the Egyptians and the Assyrians limp on for a couple more centuries as to why that is. And I'm wondering whether it is, you know, proximity to the um, to the sea peoples, you know, whether they did in fact come from Greece or was it something, you know, something as mundane as, you know, Greece sitting on three tectonic plates, you know, the Eurasian, the African mm. and the um, Aegean plate and was just simply more susceptible to natural disasters. The same with um, parts of Anatolia as well. That's um, th that's a good argument. I mean, the one thing that I could say, I'm not disagreeing with you just to, you know, get all the options out there, I suppose. Um, the other the other um, hypothesis that's been advanced is, is that, um, the one of the reasons why the Mycenaeans fall hardest is because um, this this doesn't represent well. Perhaps you know you have the Dorian invasion, but there's also um, a political collapse, um, you know, of this Mycenaean sovereignty over the rest of Greece. And um, again, you know, we, if we want to draw in um, the myths there, um, Agamemnon, who of course was the king of Mycenae and, mm -hmm. and you know the, the lord of the Greeks in the in the Homeric myths at this time, um, upon his return to Greece after the war, um, he is murdered by his wife, Clytemnestra. Yeah. Uh, and so we see the sort of breakdown of this, of this sovereignty. And so who knows, maybe that, maybe that, re um, reflects it. Maybe, you know, I mean, I mean, we'll get onto the historicity of the Trojan yes. war in a couple of days, but, 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 um, yeah. Um, so, so there's this, um, there's this idea that perhaps the conflicts that they were engaged in 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 Anatolia, um, et, um, et cetera, were, were were too much for this burgeoning state to bear, and it, it collapsed. But um, yeah, the, an influx of peoples. I, I personally think it's it's multiple things going on at once. You know, sort of um, perfect storm sort of thing. Yeah, I, I think I think a combination of of the sea peoples be what they may slash the Dorians, uh, and I did reference this also earlier. I, I think that the uh, the Greek uh, states at this time or right you know the, the the kingdoms as they were were far more dependent or at least demonstrated by the archaeological evidence were the most dependent on this sort of maritime the thalassocratic sea trade yeah that with the cessation of the sea trade in concert with these other conditions with these other circumstances were, were probably hit hardest which th that in itself would have with a kind of an economic collapse sort of precipitated a political collapse. And that is why I think you see this disintegration at the end of the Mycenaean period. Certainly. Yeah. I mean, I mean, cause I, I, if they're the sea peoples, right. Once, once, once the sea is no longer open to them. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, that's, that's where right. they were. I mean, if you look at pretty much everything that they were using from their, the material culture to um, um, the kind of um, text that they were writing, all of these things are clearly, um, the result of their engagement in this in this uh, maritime economy, and once the maritime economy is gone, all those things go as well because we've right. not had enough time to sort of establish these things in Greece independently. You know, 
Well, you can almost say, that, well, just just a theory as a layman, you know, you, you two very much are the, the classical authorities compared to my own limited expertise on this matter. Um, but for, from my reading on this, um, I found out that um, the Mycenaeans had a very, especially for the time, an incredibly centralized system of administration within the within the palace structures, you know, which were basically like wall citadels with um, with their own sort of manufacturing centers, military barracks, etc. Um, that the you know the king was the head of a warrior caste, and in Mycenae the, the the word is wanax or anax, and that the anax held not only you know supreme power of the land, not only was he the spiritual and military leader, but he was also the center of commerce and trade in the the state of My, the, the Mycenaean states as well, and that this extended even beyond just the control of trade, but also to the control and redistribution of goods and labor, i.e. they were operating under some form of kind of like a proto-command economy. And so a political collapse also coinciding with the collapse of trade, you know, to that incredibly rigid political system, you could almost say they would go hand in hand and facilitate each other. Certainly. I mean, I mean, this is um, very common in, in you know, um, I guess somewhat primitive militaristic cultures. I mean, Anglo-Saxon England comes to mind, you know, where the, the, the ideal of a good lord is, you know, the giver of rings. You know, he, 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 he takes everything in after a battle and then, you know, at a feast, say, he, he redistributes it to, to, his, um, to his warriors. And that's how he, how he maintains his power base, like you say. Um, and again, um, um, you know, we, we see references to dividing up the spoils in, 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 in Homer. So, yeah, I, I'd say with the, with the collapse of um, um, the maritime economy and these foreign influences, not only do you have um, um, you, not not only can you no longer maintain the level of material culture and and, and um, writing and so forth, but you also can't maintain the same kind of political control. It's just not possible. Absolutely, I think this this will play greatly into the story of um, Greece in the future, because of course Greece starts off as a monarchical, centralized society. Even though, as as you mentioned with um, Agamemnon, even if you know we don't necessarily believe in the historicity of um, the claims advanced by Homer, we are to assume that there was, you know, certain elements of power and it was all under the purview of a of a lord or a high king in the form of the king of Mycenae. Um, one of the effects of the Dark Ages is, as we mentioned, the political collapse and the devolution of authority from this complex centralized structure of Mycenae to more oligarchic structures. And if nothing else, you can say that this period of the Dark Age, which, you know, among other things, we have the, the loss of um, the Greek language, as you mentioned, um, um, you know, in terms of their writing ability, and they're having to be relearned from the Phoenicians. But um, you can say it almost represents the demise, not only of kings, but of the con concept of kingship itself in many regards. Yet when we have kingship later on, especially, we'll get to the Spartan constitution, um, it's very much a, um, a, a devolved series of powers and, uh, you know, a, a, as much as a sordid modern term system of checks and balances, for lack of a better um, analogy. Mm. And this becomes, you know, the rulership of aristocrats. And this is where the idea of a tyrant comes from, you know, not a king in the traditional sense, but a, a ruler who is lacking in a certain sort of um, legitimacy, which is, you know, given by, you know, inherited succession, etc. Yeah. And I would, I would add to that, that, um, you know, because it seems that this sort of this process that you're describing um, took place in the more developed south, you know, in the Peloponnese and and in Attica. Um, but but it, but if you if you look to the north in, in Thrace and Macedon, um, where perhaps you didn't have the same level of Mycenaean development, um, kingship persists for 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 much longer, yep. and 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 in a much more um, um, potent form. The the uh, another thing to consider also is that. If you look at the construction of what they call the Third Palace period of the Mycenaean uh, era, which is you know around four, four, uh, 1450 to twelve hundred BC, is that if you look in these cities, whether you know we're talking about Athens or uh, Mycenae or Argos, Thebes, even the archaeology that or what's being dug up and, and what is being sort of uh, brought to our attention uh, is that even though these systems politically collapse with the the coming dark age two things happen one you still have the formation of the you might say is the original the genesis of the concept of the polis of mm. the greek city because these 
most of these places that are on the map that you've got up here end up re-establishing themselves, as end up reasserting themselves as cities, be it as as uh, as oligarchies, as democracies, or even as you know, de despot uh, you take Spart with the the two kings, for instance. These are, but they still have sophisticated levels of power structure, of fortifications, defenses, and uh, and they sort of date to roughly similar period. With the exception, of course, being Mycenae itself, which um, I believe is destroyed and rebuilt several times. Yes, yeah. exactly. Well, the, the power there in Argos basically goes to Argos mm. rather than Mycenae. Mm. So before we um, we move on to the classical Greeks proper, um, I, I've given, you know, a, 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 of course, that you know, so much more that one can say about the Mycenaean period and the Bronze Age collapse, but um, spe uh, specifically about the Greek Dark Ages. Um, which roughly corresponds to um, around sort of 1200 to 1100 BC until um, 800 BC. Um, does anyone have anything to elaborate you know, more on the very, very brief overview that I've provided? Um, I mean, in terms of what happens, like you say, um, um, knowledge of writing seems to be lost. There's no, there's no examples of, any, of um, linear B continuing. Um, so that's gone. Um, we, we see um, depopulation on quite a large scale. All of these centers that we're talking about, um, um, you know, their populations plummet and there seems to be much less um, activity. There's no um, fine material goods being produced. Um, in fact, you know, I mean, in the Mycenaean period, um, you, you had, you had um, some relatively fine pottery, you know, I mean, you can go look at like the, um, the Mycenaean warrior vases and things like this. I mean, they're, they're not as good as say an attic vase from classical Athens, but they're, they're, they're you know, they're, 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 they're quite fine. They're fine decorative things. Um, but during the dark age, we see um, um, a total reversion across Greece to very simple forms, you know, yes. um, no decoration, it's sort of incised decoration, you know, the zigzags and lines and, and um, yeah, yeah, there's no, there's no um, 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 complex figural decoration at all. Um, you might and that, and very that, little opulence, you know. Yeah, but it's more than that. I mean, you, 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 there, there are no depictions of people or animals, um, and, and all of this stuff only starts to come back, like you say, around 700 BC. So for hundreds of years, we're in this, um, this, this real dark age. Um, but this is also, of course, the period of Homer and, and, um, I suppose of Hesiod, although he's a little bit later. Um, and we see, um, yeah, yeah. The resurgence of, of, of Greece, of Greece after this, and in, 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 I guess a stronger form than ever before, but it's, it's, it's a really, it's a really rough period, a really desperate time. It's fascinating, isn't it? Because just thinking about it, I, I do wonder, and I do compare this to the other civilizations of the time. We've already mentioned about the Hittite civilization collapses. Um, but, you know, the Egyptian civilization, you know, continues in some form. It just it doesn't just disappear. And um, it's the same with the Assyrian Empire. And of course, they will be reformed into the Neo-Assyrian Neo Empire. In fact, mm. in the Levant in particular, of course, the Neo-Assyrians would be replaced by the Neo-Babylonian Empire. So there's yeah. always, you know, you can almost say a continuity, at least in the um, the Levant and in the um, the Mashriya called, you know, Mesopotamia. Well, again, and, I um, think that's because um, in Egypt and in Mesopotamia, I mean, they've just been they've they've been established as complex civilizations for for at this point thousands of years, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so so there's that there's that deep well of you know infrastructure and tradition, I, I guess, to, to draw on. Whereas in Greece, that just didn't exist yet. I well, mean, I from the con. Oh, sorry, sorry, I am. Sorry, Mark. No, sorry, Marcus, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that you, we have to sort of imagine too that, you know, from the context of a citizen of Mycenae or of Thebes or Violkos, that even at their, their high point, or even if you consider the point of their decline, where this, the, the, the rupture is starting to uh, lessen their way of life and to, you know, bring a, a curtain on their period, so to speak, that at this point, Sumer and Ur and ancient Egyptian Thebes and you know the, the pyramids were already old places and very old structures even mm. from their point standpoint yeah well, totally. so, sorry I, I was just thinking about this I mean you mentioned the old structures of course there was geographically geographic relocation um, when it comes to the Egyptians of course it was relocation across the Nile which was the hub and the um, Mesopotamia and it was the Tigris and the Euphrates but the fascinating thing, as uh, Marx pointed out, the emergence of what we could recognize as the polis system is that, you know, Argos, Pylos, Thebes, Athens, you know, they remain. They remain as um, as political entities, as, um, you know, as cities. You know, they, they shrink for a while, but they 
reconglomerate later. So one wonders, you know, you could almost say in some aspects there is more continuity in that regard. And yet you have this 300, you know, 400 period where it seems the entire history is just gone completely. And I, I just can't quite wrap my head around that. Yeah, I mean, I've been studying this for years and I can't either. I mean, one 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 wonders what it must have been like to be there. It must have been it must have been truly appalling, you know. But um we 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 yeah we do see continuation and we also see I suppose um you know I mean, it depends on um, how much faith you put in in genealogies but we do see the continuance of um family lines and and and, and um you know much of the the claims to sovereignty that are, are that are made um in in the later period do you know I mean I mean all of the families and uh, draw on the Homeric past and the Mycenaean past for to to legitimize themselves you know Absolutely. even the name. Um, Helenus, you know, comes from that Homeric tradition of trying to reforge links with this period. Um, so I think that's probably a good time to move on to the archaic period in Greek history. Sure. Um, in terms of the you know, chronology, which I'm going to be using, um, I think it's safe to say that, you know, in terms of like events which um, delineate this period, um, the Olympic Games, the foundation of it in 776 BC is quite a good starting point. And, you know, I'll end it at... Um, 499 so with the um the greco -Per persian the Gre greco persian wars in earnest essentially if that's all right so um you know first question i really have to ask is how is this possible because it does almost seem like a renaissance and um in terms of just my again mis relatively misinformed understanding um we've already mentioned the fact that the phoenicians were responsible for reintegrating the greek alphabet and the fact that you know the ne neo assyrian empire persists beyond the assyrian empire uh, could you say that there is some sort of historical link in the same way that the modern Renaissance was inspired by contact with the Byzantine Empire from the Crusades onwards? Could you say that there is some form of Oriental influence from the from Mesopotamia that is bringing Greek civilization back to life? Oh, I mean, I, I well, it's difficult, right? Because it is reestablishing things, I suppose, but it's reestablishing them along new lines, you know. I, I, and certainly, um, um, the the the, the reemergence of you know the Mediterranean economy, you know, and bear in mind this is now centuries later, um, we do see it reemerge, and, and and we get economic complexity again, and the Greeks begin to trade again, and of course, at this point, um, the Phoenicians are. At the height of their sort of power and influence, the Phoenicians, by the way, are yeah people from um, the Levant, um, from cities like Tyre, and um, you know the, the, these these are eventually these are the ancestors of the Carthaginians, who were also a very mercantile um, naval people. Um, now, I, I'd say that the, the reengagement in this Mediterranean um, maritime economy allowed the Greeks to begin reestablishing um, um, complex hierarchies in their societies. Um, complex political authority, and of course, it allows them to, um, um, you know, um, give them all sorts of new administrative tools using the Phoenician um, script. But in terms of um, um, the, the, them, sort of, you know, like a Petrarch, you know, rediscovering, you know, their their own history in um, Anatolia or from the Phoenicians, I don't buy that because I think uh, even even in the darkest of the dark ages, um, um, Greek culture was was still lived by by the majority of people um, and of course they spoke the language they told the stories you know they they they, they had their they had the same myths the same gods um um so 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 I, I i i don't know i mean but in terms of the the establishment along new lines that, that that's a really important thing to consider because we see the importation of um, like I said, um, influences from Egyptian sculpture, and and that actually didn't so much take place in the Mycenaean era, right? Um, that only seems to really take place um, um, now, you know, in the beginning of um, um, the Archaic, we begin to see um, Greek statuary for the first time, really, which um, um, of course goes on to be such a massive part of of Greek culture. So um, we we see, I suppose, some things coming in from outside, some new capabilities coming in from outside, but other things seem to um, come from within. And the thing I would focus more on, you know, from within, of course, this coincides with a um, a massive increase in the population, which um, results in this this process of the amalgamation of all these smaller settlements, which had succeeded the the Mycenaean period, um, 
uh, senoesism, which is this this notion of creating these new um, urban centers, of which, of course, is the case with um, Athens and Argos and the emergence of, you know, walled settlements during this period at the same time, such as Corinth. Um, and again, in terms of the political significance for this, um, as a result of the creation of these new urban centers and also the decline of the notion of monarchy and this you know, devolution into oligarchy, um, the city would become, you know, the central hub for Greek political life, you know, the Greek word polis is, of course, where we get the word politics, you know, the, the idea of a body of citizens or some sort of ruling class coming together and making decisions as reflecting their entire life, you know, even the, um, the, the namesake of this podcast, Politeia, is derived, is derived from that word, you know, is utilized by Aristotle, meaning, you know, form of state system or government or constitution, even though, you know, we use that very broadly in this assessment. And um, it's during this period that we see the creation of these, not just entities, these political entities, but also a body of, you know, a legal code, you know, a, a long stretching legal code and complex systems of, um, um, you know, um, of, of rulership, of state building, which um, you can almost see is relatively unique, um, especially compared to the rest of the world. As we mentioned, the other empires at this time were still rather monarchical, especially in the north as well. Oh, certainly. Uh, yeah, it's it's unparalleled anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just uh, wanted to talk to the uh, speak on the recovery for for a moment. The the thing we have to consider is that with the sort of the collapse of Mycenae, we have to obviously consider un the circumstances un under which that happens. It's a it's, ma you know, mass migration of peoples. It's the collapse of trade it's the collapse of economic productivity. And in in, in the a, a pre modern context, we actually have to be cognizant of the fact that all right that doesn't mean just you know more money or less money or you know uh being able to hoard wealth or what have you for the common person the common day of the pre-modern time period it literally meant eating by and large and if a society can't produce an excess of foodstuffs it cannot apply its attention to anything else the arts poetry politics what have you and with the recovery period I think what we see is there's never a cessation of movement of peoples, but certainly after the the sea peoples and the Hyksos, whatever their origins, whatever became of them, we don't really know. It's still debated to this day, but there is a decline in the movement of, of peoples. There is much less in the way of the mass migrations and the invasions, which came with the sea peoples that along with the recovery of some degree of trading, I mean, for instance, in in sort of post Mycenaean Greece, in the recovery period of this this uh, archaic period, you know, the beginnings of classical Greece, already by the seventh and eighth century BC, you already have metal works and artworks that have been imported to Greece from places such as Syria and Armenia. So already there must be enough stability, regional stability, in the eastern half of the Mediterranean, in the, in the Near East, to reestablish some of these trade networks. Yeah. Yeah, a lot. I mean, you had, you had, I'd say, you'd say you had a really rough, what, 300, 300 years. 300 years, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but then at, at the exact time you're talking about when you begin to see again the re importation of um, metal goods, you know, from the Levant, um, this is also the beginning of um, um, the Greek artistic tradition. I mentioned um, um, the, the terrible degradation of pottery forms that we saw yeah. during this 300 year rough period. Well, around, yeah. it's around 800, you know, 800, it's 900 BC. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, it doesn't, it doesn't recover fully, but we see the beginning of what gets called the geometric period, right? Where we yeah, see exactly. um, va vases, which are, which are quite fine, but again, um, very simple. And, and any people who are represented are yeah. you know the, the the body is you know a sort of long upside down triangle you know a black triangle and then you have a little black circle for the head and then some legs and arms you know and so it's it's very very basic but um we well, but but th this art um and this this pottery um it does show again that that, that Greek culture is persisting because we have um in these very early vases from 900 BC we have the Homeric myths you know um, I mean some of you know you you'll see you know a man leading a woman Woman, you know um to his ship you know running with her and and, and yeah. you know most people think that that's meant to be paris stealing helen you know so um 
Um, yeah. yeah, this is so we see we see the, the rebirth of these things, the renaissance yeah. of these things, if you will. And that's very true. And that sort of pertains to my that sort of pertains to the point I was making that you have this increase of stability both inst in, internally within the Greek various Greek polities and externally within the region that allows this recovery to take place. And something as so basic as a city or a community's ability to produce food so that it can stave off starvation, so that it can grow its population and focus on these other endeavors. And I think that in the eighth century onwards, to the extent where, and I mean, we can see with this map now that AAM has pulled up, the Greeks experience a population boom, which actually forces them to essentially found colonies outside of Greece. Absolutely. And this was the, the point I was just going to bring up. Um, not only are these, you know, colonies set up for the purposes of trade, as you've, you've both elucidated, but also um, not uh, these Greek colonies are significant to the fact that um, in establishing a Greek colony, it is not a colony in the sense of, you know, a, a modern colony in the sense that there is some sort of connection with the motherland. Invariably, when the Greeks would start, you know, colonizing from the 8th and the 7th centuries BC onwards and, you know, establishing uh, in particular, as we can see on that map, vast number of colonies were established in um, Sicily and um, Magna Graecia, or the, re the region of um, oh, Magna Graecia, literally in Latin means um, Great Greece. Um, mm -hmm. But as, as we can see, um, colonies such as Syracuse even became policies, i.e. self-governing entities in their own right as well, which is, you know, completely different from, say, the Roman example. And this, again, is testament to the fact there is possibly an overpopulation in Greece at this time, which is um, precipitating this movement outwards. And um, this, again, this idea to create various emporiums throughout um, all the Mediterranean as well. Something to me very romantic about this idea of being able to liberally, you know, leave your own city and create an entirely new, you know, political structure anywhere in the Mediterranean at this time, which again is testament to, uh, as you've also elucidated, the Greeks as a fundamentally seafaring people. And this is, you know, demonstrating the fact that they have regained control of much of the um, the Mediterranean Sea, even though, as Columbo has mentioned, at the same time, they are competing with the Phoenicians and the Punic, the Punic um, civilization of Carthage, which is established at the same time. Yeah, uh, and um, in terms of you mentioned the Emporium, these are set up everywhere, and and they have um they have huge um, um redounding importance down the centuries. I mean, you you have um, um Naukratis, which is in Egypt, and it's and and, and this basically establishes a Greek presence in in Egypt um, from what 500 600 BC, you know. Um, and so then when you see um, Alexander and Ptolemy come in later. Um, they they sort of they sort of build off of this core that already existed, I guess you could say. Um, so yeah, I just I just add that. Yes, yeah, somebody... sorry, yes, Marcus. I was just going to say because I I did reference the 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 formation or the the genesis of Apollos, and what the Greeks do is when they, for instance, the first Sicilian colony I believe was Naxos, um, in Sicily, which was founded a year or a year or two prior to either Catania or Syracuse. I can't remember exactly, but basically wherever these these cities are founded and established, and be it Syracuse, be it Naxos, be it uh, Pystum, which was uh, founded as the Greek city of Pisidonia, um, it's built upon similar lines of there is a public assembly, there is the temples, there's an Odeon, there's theatre, there's the center for politics all these things which are of important to greeks in their homeland are exported and almost sort of carbon copied in these colonies and it's almost as if the romans learned from this um and this isn't about rome so i don't want to sort of go on a tangent but the romans do learn from this but this sort of this adaption of being able to transplant the polis is a greek ideal yeah you, can, you yeah. can say that this is uh, as i mentioned with the mycenaeans a remarkable consistent um thing with the greeks is that um even though they are politically divided throughout their entire history um they're able to replicate and reproduce this almost uniform culture and in, in terms of this um culture sort of improving during this period you know i've got an image up of the um the temple of apollo at corinth we begin to um see a distinctively ancient greek style of architecture which of course will be improved um during the fifth century bc which is the greek golden age and um you know it's during this time you mentioned columba the the continuity of a religious pantheon uh we have the you know development of that you know in part thanks to the homeric epi um, epics in addition to other influences you know developing into the um the pantheon of 12 gods you know led by zeus and hera and um we begin you know establishing the 
ancient sanctuaries at Delphi, which is you know the site of the famous oracle at Delphi, and the sanctuary of Zeus at Olympia. You know, all of these um, you know religious cults and um, temples are emerging from this period. Um, yeah. One question, and again, and again, in terms of moving on to the the Greek Golden Age or the period of the classical period, as it were. Um, we of course have the um, the epic poetry of Homer, as we've mentioned consistently. Um, of, of, of other epic poets such as um, Archilochus, um, we have the beginning of um, uh, Greek philosophy under um, Talis of um, Talis of Miletus. Miletus, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, uh, and again, as you've you've already mentioned, uh, art and pottery. But something I'd like to um, to get back on you know, before we get to the sort of a great sort of um, chronological event, which is the um, the Greco-Persian War, is um, to talk a bit about the development of these specific policies. You know, in addition, um, you know, primarily Athens. So, sure. uh, uh, could I just could I just note one thing just before we get on to that? Because you mentioned um, two things, right? I don't want to um, misrepresent what you're saying, right? But um, you mentioned the um, the the beginning of temples, right? Um, now. Yeah, we. Uh, this is the beginning of, I suppose, what an average person um, would recognize as a Greek temple, right? Um, well, for first we get the Doric order, which is you can see these columns with the the flat top and and um, they, they they taper out to the bottom. Um, mm -hmm. We do have that, but um, in terms of um, trying to draw links between this and what came earlier, yes. um, if you yeah, if you go back to um, 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 Mycenae and and even during the Dark Age, we can see um, structures that do have um similarities although you know in the dark age they're very very simple you know most most of the time they're made of wood mm -hmm. but what we do see again we will see um the um oh god what's the word how have i forgotten um you know the the, the triangular sort of um um top you know in front of the roof you know I, i'm sorry that's, i should remember the word but yeah the, the triangular top but we also see um in a lot of greek temples the entrance is sort of a couple of rows of pillars in you know and and you'll have this porch coming out um supported by pillars which gets called a pronaos and and we we, we see this in dark age um sort of chief chieftain structures and um long houses we we see this um yeah this this porch out front supported by a couple rows of pillars with the triangular roof and then we see that um that architectural form um transposed into stone and improved on in the archaic so the archaic is really the um the the, the what's the word the, the the establishment the setting in stone we might say um sometimes literally of um of the greek culture that had come before and that had, that had sort of developed through the dark age and again in terms of setting things in stone um you mentioned you mentioned homer now homer wasn't um wasn't from the archaic homer was if he was a if he was one man he lived in the the dark ages oh sorry uh, uh, to my understanding he was all he was just on the cusp just, just right on the, the just dark on the ages cusp, before right. the archaic period. Yeah, yeah, um, just on the cusp. But then what we see is in the archaic, again, we see these things being established and set in stone. So in the archaic, um, really not that long before, like you mentioned, the Greco-Persian Wars, um, there is a tyrant um, in Athens by the name of Pisistratos. And Pisistratos, he, because obviously the Homeric stories have been handed down as an oral tradition since the Mycenaean era, you know, um, for hundreds and hundreds of years, these stories have been passed down by men called rhetors who would go from village to village and, um, and sing, you know, a part of the story, you know, they would, they would, you know, um, sing a specific section over a couple of days from memory, as far as we can tell, which is remarkable. But, um, it was during the reign of Pisistratos, who was the tyrant of Athens, that the first canonical textual version of the Iliad and the Odyssey were produced. The version that would then be shared and, you know, uh, um, shared as part of the literary culture, the canonical version um, was created then. So again, we see these things being set in stone, you know? Um, so I just wanted to add that. Oh, yes, and you, you mentioned, of course, the tyrant of Athens. And I think, you know, bringing this back to like some sort of political continuity, um, you know, the the emergence of a polis, as we know, the most famous of which being the Athenian democracy, of course, is a straightforward process. The seventh century BC, for example, is known as the um, the age of tyrants, uh, and again, its pejorative association would um, would come really under Aristotle. And um, it, but in terms of like what a tyrant was, it was again sometimes used synonymously with um, the Mycenaean word, you know, anax. 
Though, as I mentioned, you know, one thing that um, identified a tyrant was the lack of legitimacy. So often, um, you know, in terms of like Aristotle's explanation for this, um, you could say that tyrannies were often established in response, you know, populist responses to intolerable oligarchies or aristocracies, as, as it were. You know, not trying to draw any modern allusions from that. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, if not that, then um, wars of you know domination between the oligarchs themselves, you're temporarily setting themselves up as you know a a monarch and all but name. In terms of sort of taking this back to Athens, um, we have the transition away from that, you know, in the sixth century, around the same time that um, Athens, seventh and sixth century, the late seventh, early sixth century, at the time which um, Athens becomes, you know, more culturally and politically dominant over the rest of Hellas or the rest of Greece. And um, we see the creation of a an archonship, which is at, at first it's an, an aristocracy dominated by members of the um, uh, Eupatridae or the you know the Athenian or the Athenian aristocracy. And then um, from that period onwards, we have the emergence of you know the great attested lawmakers such as Draco, which is you know where we get the word draconian from. Yes. Um, even though you know much of his you know draconian measures um, didn't survive him, and you know we would have the law on homicide. You know mainly he was um, attempting to stop you know the cycle of um, of revenge and stuff like that. But um, blood feuds and blood such. feuds exactly, yeah. which would define I, 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 all sort of tribal societies. Ironically, a man uh, by the name of Drakon becomes the person who distinguishes between concepts of murder and manslaughter. Yes, you exactly. <laughs> um, so, so would you like to go over? Would you like us to go over the sort of political development of um, Athens in this period? Because it is a it is a, a great story, you know. Yeah, sure. Um, if you want to take it away, then you know, go go ahead. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, you've mentioned you've mentioned Draco or Drakon, which is what um, six hundreds BC. 620 say, yeah 620 so so um we we have that we have that tyranny and then he is um he's deposed i think or or, he, or he, he dies he's gone and then we have a sort of reversion to the oligarchy that you mentioned um and then in the 500s we have um Pisistratus who takes power um Pisistratus actually takes power three times i think um the first time he has his own men uh, no no the first time he takes over um, I think he might have been invited to take over. I'm not sure, but he's booted out. Um, the second time he gets his own men to beat him up. And then he comes into the city and says, look what's happened to me. I need, I need you to grant me some guards. Um, so the story goes. And so the elders met and they, 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 they decreed that they would give him a, a body of young men as, as, a, as a bodyguard. And then with this bodyguard, he immediately takes power. Um, he's deposed again. And this time, um, um according to um i think i think it's um herodotus i'm not sure um apparently he hired a woman named Frine, who was a, a sort of tall um handsome you know beautiful woman um um and he he had her dressed up like athena you know with the helm and and you know um, um and she and she she rode a chariot with um Pisistratos next to her into Athens, and apparently, um, um, the people were, you know, praying to her as a goddess. They they, they fell for it. And well, Athena, started... of course, Athena, of course, being the we haven't mentioned this, the patron goddess of Athens. Who, well, um... yeah, I mean, the clues in the name, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but yeah, and this this is when he um, firmly establishes his power, um, and then and then he, and then he rules. I think until his death. Now, um, after his death, his two sons, um, Hippias and oh god. Ah, okay. So he has two sons, Hippias, and I can't remember the name of the other one. Okay, you'll, you'll have to you'll have to take my word for it that he also he also existed. Um, they 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 sort of take over their father's rule, but there's dissatisfaction, um, and it grows and grows. Um, and and um, Hippias in particular becomes, um, I guess he sort of goes a bit mad with power, and he begins committing um, outrages and insults on the people until you have um, two nobles. Um, who were, um, you know, being Greeks lovers, right? Um, called Harmodius and Aristogeiton, and these two um, assassinate Hippias. Um, apparently, they had their swords hidden in, you know, baskets at a festival, and they, they drew them and slew them. Um, and then, and then they they become um, the sort of, I guess, the martyrs of democratic Athens, right? Um, and, and there's a couple of other developments um, in this same period after um, the tyrants. You have um, Solon, right, who's a sort of poet and statesman, and he is invited 
um, by the Athenians to basically become dictator and and um, and set the laws for Athens. And so he tries to redress all sorts of problems with debt and and land um, um, and such like. Um, and then he actually, um, so the story goes, he, he gets all of the Athenians to swear that they will abide by his laws. Um, mm. And then he leaves Athens forever to, to ensure that they will stick by his laws for, I think, at least 10 years. Um, so, so we have um, we, we have that happen. And then we have, um, um, at this point, Athenian politics are divided between three groups. We have the, 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 the tribe of the plains, the tribe of the coast, and the tribe of the hills. Um, now, and, and they're, they're sort of the ones who have been battling, and um, this, these sort of divisions were what Pisistratus was taking advantage of. I believe he represented the people of the hills. Um, but post-Solon, we have uh, Cleisthenes. And Cleisthenes is very important because in his constitutional reforms, he shifts the system. The sh system is no longer run on the basis of the plains folk, the hills folk, and the coastal folk. It is run on the basis of explicitly economic class. The society is divided into the slaves and then the very poorest class and then the hoplites, you know, the hoplite class. Um, who you know are meant to be able to afford their own suit of armor and such like, and then we have the very top class, the pentacosio medimnoi, which is a term which basically signifies you have a certain amount of grain, you know, a certain amount of um, land, um, and so and so this system is produced, and in producing this system, and in and in uh, re-establishing the way that Athenian politics works with this new constitution, um, Cleisthenes and Solon laid the foundations for um, democratic Athens. Yes, thank you. Can I can I just elaborate on that specifically, just in sure. terms? I mean, you already mentioned um, the the reforms of um, Solon. I think, am I correct in saying that he was also responsible for expanding the parameters of Athenian citizenship? Um, and, in and in terms I, I, of I and in terms of um, Cleisthenes, I mean, you already mentioned um, uh, the categorization of peoples um, into those categories. However. Um, is it also true that um, he was responsible for creating the Council of the 500 and giving the citizenry more control over political and judicial appointments, which, of course, would lead to the um, the very short terms of, you know, the position of strategos or like the um, the military yeah. chieftain, commander in chief yeah. in Athens? It wasn't um, it wasn't just a matter of sort of reshuffling the class system. It was a total. Um, quite a radical shift in in the yeah yeah we had all these new councils these new bulles and and um and, and um you know um, juridical juridical positions um and, and yeah we see the establishment of a recognizable Athenian state in this in in this in this period that's um not just a simple a simple tyranny so um yeah you can we can um overstate the importance of Solon and Cleisthenes in that respect absolutely uh, thank you th yeah. sorry Marcus. Oh no, you're right. Um, I was just going to say two, two quick things. One, we also can't forget that ironically, um, uh, that uh, Pisistratus uh, was actually a one-time brother-in-law of Cleisthenes as well. As ironic as that is. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, I forgot that. Yeah, they were related, weren't yeah, they? Yeah. And he, and his two sons were Hipparchus and Hippias, if I'm not mistaken. Hipparchus. That's Hipparchus. It, yeah. Yeah. Because he's because oh. it's Hippias that becomes a tyrant. Um, but what I was going to say about Cleisthenes and his reforms was that uh, class uh, to address the this persistent sort of gyration and tumult of of uh, of, of different oligarchs coming to the fore and taking power in these sort of cycles of despotism or de ty tyranny, as, as they would call it. Can I just um, say, I love the use of the word gyration. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> oh, I'm trying to be imaginative. Um, that, no, uh, I applaud it. It's fantastic. <laughs> that um, Cleisthenes also sought to um, clip the wings of the oligarchs by restricting the power of the um, Eropagos, the, the council of the Exarchons, yeah, the Areopagus. Yeah, the, the the who met on the the Areopagus, the hill of Ares. You know. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, it, in order to ad address the gyrations of power, uh, Cleisthenes uh, did restrict their um their uh, authority and influence within the the city. Yes. Well, thank you very much for that. But we, I think, we do have to move on very quickly because yes, yes. we haven't, we haven't, we haven't got to the three big wars we're going to cover yet. <laughs> so, um, just, so just quickly, oh, very golly. quickly, very quickly, before we get on to the uh, Greco-Persian War, 
um, just a quick summary of the, the Spartan constitution, which is you know mostly attested by Thucydides, so coming at the time of the Peloponnesian Wars. Um, as far as I'm aware, the original Spartan constitution is um, attributed to um, Lycurgus. Lycurgus, yeah. Lycurgus, and uh, sorry if I in, in, interchange between hard seas and soft seas. Oh, I do it too, don't worry. I do it with the, with um, with Romans particularly. I, yes, I can't exactly. stand Tacitus, you know, it's no. just wrong. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> cities. <laughs> okay, um, continue, continue. But um, uh, as far as I'm aware, one of the major events for Sparta was the... Um, uh, Messianum War, uh, which resulted in the enslavement of the um, said Messian, eh, sorry, my, my pronunciation, um, Messianians, um, which would become essentially the, the the Spartan, you know, race caste or the Helots. The Helots, and, yeah. and of course, the as we'll find out going into the chronology, the um, order of the Helots would become a perennial problem for the Spartans, who operated as a as again a military aristocracy. Um, in terms of their regime, of course, you have the division between the um, Gorosio, the elders, the, the Spartan assembly, uh, the ephors or the seers, and you also had a king at the same time. So it wasn't, you know, like a Athens where um, the, you had the two system, kings. Yes, it, it kind of again like the Roman consul, um, mm. who very much, you know, offered like um, who resembled the form of a commander in chief. And, you know, all of these systems essentially had the power to check each other. And, of course, it would be the Spartan Assembly who would be the ones um, to declare war, especially when it comes to the Peloponnesian period. I'm um, just elaborating from that, of course, is that we have the um, the system of leagues, which would, you know, evolve into the Delian and the Peloponnesian leagues. Um, this, again, is a, another feature of Greece, is that Greece wouldn't um, formally consolidate central authorities and in, into regions. Uh, now, correct me if my pronunciation is wrong, but I believe the region around Sparta was um, called uh, Lacedaemonia, yeah, or some, uh, something lac like that. Lacdemon, usually. Lac Lacdemon, Lacdemonia. Um, thank you for that. Um, Lac uh, Laconia is probably easy if you want to. Yes, Laconia. Yes, lazy yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, Marcus. Um, You're welcome. So and again, Laconia would um, refer to you know, the, the region around the region around Sparta. It would never consolidate into these um, you know, greater kingdoms. You would always have the city at the center, and the basis of power wouldn't be in expanding the city to conquer other cities, but in federating those other cities in the various leagues. And invariably, I believe that um, not only would these um, cities, you know, form into leagues in terms of you know trading benefits. So, for example. Um, you know whether that city has you know vast amounts of silver or material resources but also the alliances of the cities were based around the ethnos you know, we already mentioned the the four tribes of greece the um uh, in particular the dorians and the ionians are of particular in interest you know the the athenians would periodically ally with the ionians who were you know coincidentally on the um the anatolian coast yeah. whereas say for I, example I guess, um Sorry, this just leads on perfectly into into the beginning of the Persian War. Yes, so, exactly. You know. So I'll, I'll get to, I'll finally get to the um, <laughs> chronology of the Greco Persian Wars. Uh, so just to give you a, a bit of a background, of course, we mentioned how important the power structures in the East were um, to the reemergence of a Greek civilization in the Archaic period. So just give me a second. I'll just change this. Um, nice, lovely map of. Um, the Greco-Persian War. Um, well, there was a major political consolidation going on in Asia at this time. Um, prior to this, there had been the Babylonian Empire, there had been a, um, a weak, a much weakened Egypt, and there, of course, had been the Median Empire. And then a Persian king, an Achaemenid king called um, Cyrus comes along in the region we now know as Persis, which is you know, the, the Farsa region, the Fars region in modern day Iran. And from that position, he would successfully, essentially, he's one of the great conquerors of history. Throughout the middle of the 6th century BC, he would conquer the Babylonian Empire and he would conquer the Median Empire. There's just one question I have before getting on to the, the actual, uh, the first um, skirmishes between you know, Cyrus and the Ionians. Um, there was the kingdom, I believe, of Lydia, which was, you know, in interior of Anatolia. How much was that kingdom Hellenized? um somewhat somewhat I mean, I mean if you look at um, um the kingdom of lydia is actually the earliest example of coinage right mm. I, and, and the coinage you know bears a lot of similarities to um um what we see later in in greece so i, I suppose you could sort of you could argue that but um i believe that um herodotus says that um you had so so, so you had um 
a, a, a dynasty that ruled Lydia, who I think he described as Greeks. But then um, you had um, another dynasty that took over, and then that dynasty, in, in turn, um, the dynasty of King Candales, was taken over by um, Gyges. You know, there's the famous story um, that King Candales, who was apparently a bit of a, of a creep, you know, um, he was he was um, so proud of the beauty of his wife that he got in his um, his sort of manservant, Gyges, and said, okay, listen, um, um, tonight when I go to bed, my wife is going to undress and I want you to watch um, through, through a crack in the door. Um, and apparently the wife um, noticed that Gyges was watching but didn't let on that she knew. And later on summoned Gyges into her presence and said, listen, um, you know, you have dishonored me, so I'm going to give you two choices. You either die now or you kill my husband and become king. Oh yeah, so yes. uh, yeah, yeah, and so and so and so there, there there's a there's a there's a sort of complex history of perhaps a Greek dynasty, um, perhaps um, and, and and then later on not, but I mean certainly the the, the west coast, you know, um, Ionia or, or the Anatolian west coast, um, very very Greek, but in terms of um, once you hit the interior into Lydia. Um, no, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call them Greeks, although there are um, um, similarities. I mean, I mean, there are there are similarities going back a long way. I mean, you know, the Trojans, you could argue, were you know um, somewhat similar to the Greeks again, but it gets I, quite I think, nebulous. I think there's a case here also for um, discussing the concept of you know you might say cultural or civil civilizational bleed, and certainly, yeah. Given, given Lydia's proximity between what was the Hittites and the Hittites having crumbled during the, the Bronze Age collapse and the Mycenaeans, that the Lydians would, you know, quite likely or quite uh, understandably take cues from both of those cultures, having been sandwiched in between them. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, in terms of also, I mean, the Hittites, I mean, Anatolia generally, I mean, I mean, if you look at the archaeological history, um, um, you know, it could be argued that the Bronze Age started in Anatolia. There's, they're always, they always yeah. seem to have had a real knack for um, metalworking, you know, mm -hmm. and, 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 and this, this continues. I mean, I mean, not only I, mean, I mentioned the, the establishment of the first coinage, you know, which is a massive, uh, a massive invention. Um, by the way, um, you know the the descendant of um, of um, Gyges, King Croesus, was meant to have been you know the richest man in the world, you know, yeah. and it's around that exact time that we see coinage appearing. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, but 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 I, I'm pretty sure um, Thucydides, it's either Thucydides or Herodotus makes the statement um, that ironworking first came out of, of Anatolia as well. So yeah, we see this sort of long tradition of um, of, of metalworking and also um, also a focus on on horses. You know, you must remember that. Um, um, the, the the population of Anatolia um, was not at all Turkic. You know, it was um, it was oh, no. or, or no, Indo-European. No, yeah, just, just I, to I, point I, out, the Turkification of um, Greece doesn't happen until the 11th century, so a yes. long, long time. <laughs> yes, yeah. um, I, and you know, I mean, again, the 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 obsession with horses, and in, in particular, um, I mean, the, the the symbol of Troy was meant to have been the horse. You know, so mm. so we do see these things um, 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 going back a long way. So, yeah. Um. Uh, this might just amount to a little more than sort of a very loose hypothesis, but if you take into account the conquest of Anatolia and the Near East under Alexander, what we do see is a very, very rapid Hellenization of Anatolia. And I wonder if that rapid Hellenization of Anatolia can somewhat be answered to the famili familiarity in which the Anatolian interior would have had with Greek culture in the period that we're discussing now. Well, in particular, I mean, I think you've all, all we've already answered this question. I mean, you know, in the same way that Bactria was a major source of trade, you know, along the Silk Road, I believe that the reason why there was so much coinage in particular and that Lydia was associated with so much wealth is because it was the conduit between the civilizations. You know, you mentioned the Hurrians, but to the south of that, the Neo Babylonian empires. It was the natural land route between the um the civilizations of the East and the Greek civilizations. And as a result, it was this melting pot of all these cultures, which explained again the prevalence of coinage. Yes, but yes, unfortunately quite. unfortunately quite quite unstable, right? Because you know in the east of Anatolia you have God, I can't remember what it's called now, but you know, in ancient times it was called the Halis River, right? And the Halis River sort of, um, you know, delineates Anatolia from from you know um, Mesopotamia and and further east, and sort of uh, this was the boundary of the Lydian Kingdom, you know, or the Lydian Empire. Um, and I suppose sort of somewhat 
defensible, but once you're past that and once you're into Anatolia, it's very easily taken over. So it was quite, a, it was quite, a, it was quite, I suppose, a precarious situation. But I mean, the Lydian kingdom, you know, it persisted for something like 500, 600 years. So it couldn't have been that unstable, I suppose. Now I'll, I'll take always these outside empires sort of baying, you know. I'll take full responsibility for this tangent, Ron, by the way, because we need to get back to the um, chronology. Okay. Um, which is the moving swiftly version, on, or moving swiftly onwards. So we have Cyrus conquering the Ionian um, city-states along this period, as you can see on this map on, on the eastern Anatolia. And um, to my mind, what um, really spurs the, the invasion uh, by, at this time, is Darius. You know, Cyrus has been dead for about 40 years at this point, Darius the Great. Um, as far as I believe, it is um, Aristagoras of Miletus who um, is the one responsible for the Ionian revolt, um, which would last for about 499 BC after 493 BC, which is instigated after the Achaemenids failed to um, help one of his um, territorial acquisitions. And the significant thing about the Ionian revolt, not only was it you know, a Greek revolt within the empire, um, but it was crucially supported by um, Athens and the colony of Eritrea. Yeah. who supported um, the Ionian revolt during, uh, during this, which resulted in, first, Darius um, invades across the Bosphorus and he subjugates Thrace, Thrace and he subjugates Macedon. Um, however, you know, this would this would stop at Thessaly. And so he would, and again, the Macedonian relationship is going to be interesting as we move beyond that because it will be pivotal for events going forward. Um, Darius then begins to invade by sea. And you know, after he destroys Eritrea, so clearly the campaign is focused on retribution for you know, foreign interference within the internal affairs of the Achaemenid Empire. Yeah. Um, he is very famously defeated by the Athenians at the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC, mm. and this, you know, precipitates you know the more famous second invasion of Greece um, ten years later by Xerxes, because of course Darius dies in um, 486. Can I um can, can I just add a couple a couple of things here? So. Um, the first thing I would say is you, you know, you've established well um, the importance of you know the Doric and, and the Ionian um, I'm sort of subgroups within the Greeks as a whole, and that is um, the primary reason why the Athenians come to the aid of the Ionians on, on, yeah. on the coast because they're they're sort of they're sort of cousins, and and, and the the Ionians appeal to them for aid, and so and so yeah, you can see even um even if the cities are um separated somewhat you know um and chronologically and geographically they do have this um this sense of of, of loyalty to each other you or know ethnos yeah or ethnos and, yeah and also if we take into account as well at this point in time that the greeks in the sort of in the classical context in which we're discussing now have not had a challenge brought to them by sea Cyrus and his successors by this point have conquered Phoenicia and Absolutely. have the shipbuilding capabilities of Tyre yep. and Sidon and the yep. Levantine cities of the of the ex Phoenician, uh, you know, uh, polity or polities rather, and so are able to build and assemble a navy and essentially challenge Athens and the Greeks at sea, which does complicate the situation somewhat. Another 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 thing, just to add quickly, is um uh, you know of course there's the famous defeat at Marathon, but one of the other um, very important reasons for why um you know Darius's invasions couldn't couldn't you know go ahead is there was um I mean you know Cyrus had conquered a, a ungodly amount of territory you know and and, and uh, in a very short amount of time and so there was a lot of instability within the empire. I believe there was a massive revolt in Egypt at this Sorry, time. Sorry, you needed... cut out for a bit. Sorry, I was just saying that. Um, yeah, there was a there was a revolt in Egypt at this time. Yes, um, which, which yes. of course, um, you know, Egypt is, I guess, um, you know, more worth possessing than than. Well, it just it just been um, it just been recently conquered, hadn't it? It was. Yes, it was and conquered. so it was very febrile and unstable. Yeah, mm. and di and didn't Cambyses die in Egypt? If I'm not mistaken, yes, which sort of led to a succession did. crisis. Well, he, he went mad, didn't he? I, I, there was a succession crisis, and Darius yes. ultimately rose to the top. So yes, and That's just right. to give you perspective, you know, Columba has already mentioned the ungodly scale of the conquest. We're talking about an empire which stretches from India to modern-day Bulgaria. You know, it's absolutely massive. Yeah, I mean, and, I mean, um, the Persian, the Persian emperor was called the king of the four corners of the world. You know, yes. which gives you an idea of how they viewed things. So moving on to the um, to the next invasion, of course. Um, we have the famous Battle of Thermopylae. Um, would anyone want to, of course, elaborate on that? Because, you know, there is so much more to elaborate on that. Um, uh, 
Okay, no, I'll let, I'll let Marcus go. This is this is I can feel him eating to get in here. <laughs> Brewing. Um, uh, what I actually do want to say just prior to, to this though is that we should have also mentioned the scale of um, Marathon as well. Like Marathon wasn't an insignificant event. Um, and the Battle of Marathon was fought between roughly 10,000 Athenians and approximately 25 to 30,000 Persians on land. And mm. in fact, the, the, the Athenian army is led by Miltiades and Callimachus, who are the two archons, I believe, of, of, um, of Athens. And Callimachus actually dies at the battle. He's sort of, con he, you know, his death is quite celebrated in Athens as an act of um, sacrifice because he was leading the center, which was being... Um, almost split by the persians but then the greek the the the, Athe the athenian wings came in and sort of crushed the persians and they were fled back to their ships and ran away and yeah, of I mean, course it wasn't um, it because um the, the persian force was amphibious and they were trying to land and the greeks um yeah, tried the, down the, the coast the, and destroyed well, them, well, yeah. well, well callimachus was the the archon who's who basically initiated a, a, a spontaneous charge, realizing it was just a beachhead and they hadn't consolidated yet. And the fact that it was Callimachus that was slain in the battle um, is more reason why the Athenians actually celebrated his life because essentially it was that one moment of decision that sort of arguably saved them. Because if the if the if the Persians had created a beachhead and solidified their position, Marathon and that entire situation could have been very different uh, for the Athenians. Nonetheless, we um. We are uh, talking about uh, Thermopylae and the events leading up to it. Um, so the at this point in time, Darius dies and his son Xerxes comes to the, comes to the throne and Xerxes is absolutely burning with, uh, with vengeance in his heart. And uh, there's, an interesting, uh, there's an interesting insight into uh, his mindset at this point because... Um, I believe it was Xerxes who was terrified of water. So they essentially built this bridge across the Bosphorus from Abydos to oh, yeah. what is what is the city of Sestos, more or less, right? And um, and the the sea is so unsteady. There's a number of storms that occur at this point in time. So Xerxes has his bodyguard, his mortals, actually pull out their whips and lash the sea to uh to punish the gods for defying Xerxes. There's quite yeah. an interesting uh, yeah. um you know, insight into the sort of the, the potentates of the Oriental king in the case of in this case the, the king of kings of Persia. And he he assembles this monumental force to uh to attack the Greeks with. Um the ancient sources say two to three hundred thousand. I think most of us realize that that's extremely unfeasible, but let's even assume that let's see he's assembled a hundred thousand or hundred and twenty thousand. I mean, the, the ancient sources some of them say a million <laughs> like, yeah exactly yeah. it's it, it's it's quite dramatic but uh, like let's even take a figure of say 100 or 120 thousand which is at the very high end of what was uh, sustainable in terms of logistics that's still an, a monumental fighting force and um and the the greeks i believe send initially a force up to a place called tempe which is um if you look on this map, I believe it's uh, somewhere between Larissa and Pydna on this map in the north. Uh, when they see the scale of this army, this the, the, the scale of the Persian army, they flee back to Greece with news of its size, basically confirming early reports. And uh, and so the Greeks um, are in this position where they're sort of forced to unify. So the Athenians and the, and the, and the Spartans more or less come to an agreement as to how to fight the, uh, the Persians. And the again contrary to much pub, uh, modern perception it isn't just the spartans who fight at um at thermopylae the spartans are more or less there there's 300 spartans that go with their king leonidas and they're part of a 7,000 allied strong force of greeks yeah. comprising yeah. of thebans of thessalians of arcadians uh Boeotians, phocians uh, etc uh, you can see those some of those province names on this map here and they uh they fight a pitch battle at the so-called hot gates um at thermopylae for three days and they hold xerxes army at a standstill inflicting quite horrible casualties on them um but by the the third day the uh the persian uh the persian immortals are led to a go path go path by a greek shepherd by the name of ephialtes if i'm yeah, if i'm not mistaken long may his name be cursed <laughs> long may his name be cursed um and so Leonidas resolves to hold the pass with his remaining uh, Spartiates, his Spartan warriors. I believe the Thebans stay back with him as well, and the remainder of the army withdraws 
back into mainland Greece uh, through the the, Crithi, the Corinthian Isthmus uh, to the security of the, um, the where the Spartans are defending uh, the remainder of southern Greece. And uh, and then after Leonidas and his Persians are slain at the fourth and last day of the Battle of Thermopylae, uh, the the Spart uh, the Persian army marches south. They famously uh, attack and burn Athens because Athens at this point is evacuated. The Archons of Athens have actually evacuated their population onto the island, uh, just off the coast of. Um, we should also we should also note that um, around the you know pretty much at the exact same time as the Battle of Thermopylae. Columbia, you've got oh, out again. We lost him again, yeah. Yes. Um, so just carry on, Marcus. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. I, I think he's going to say there was a, I think there was a naval skirmish alongside the coast, but again, I think the Greeks evacuate it because it was indefensible with the loss of the army. So they so withdraw. The Athenian navy is fighting a sort of whole... Sorry, oh, Columbia. Um, yeah. <laughs> cutting out. Um, and so the... the, uh, the uh, the Athenian population is is uh, is evacuated to the island of Piraeus, uh, which is uh, the, the modern-day port of Athens. It's the same place. Um, and between uh, between the island and the mainland of Attica is the Gulf of Salamis. And this naval engagement is famously led by Themistocles, yeah. and they lull the Persians into very disadvantageous uh, sort of naval a uh, naval. Um, Sort of strategic position, and the Athenians have favourable winds. They uh, they arguably have better crews and better ships for the for the for the task at hand. With the exception of the Phoenician ships, the other naval components of the Persians aren't so strong. Like the Egyptian navy isn't as strong as the Phoenician ships, and some of the other yeah. auxiliary components are not as sophisticated or well built as the Phoenician ships. They basically are unable to go toe to toe with the Greeks, and the Greeks win a fantastic victory yeah. at Salamis. Um, because um, aren't aren't because much of the Persian ships that are trying to block the Greek Greek ships from coming out of the straits, a lot of the Persian ships because there's so many of them um, and they're crowded in, they the ships are other, turned. Yeah. Yeah, they're turned horizontally, you know, yeah. um, and, and the Greek ships just come in and ram straight through them. Um, but there's also yeah. stories of um, Themistocles, who you mentioned, um, um, sending a letter to Xerxes um, the night before the battle um, um, and basically saying, I, I'm secretly on your site. And um, the, the, the Greeks are all petrified and they're ready to flee. So you need to send your fleet in now, you know? And so he basically got Xerxes to act too quickly, you know, and yeah. too ambitiously. And then, and then, that, yeah, we had the great that victory. act does come to bite Themistocles in the back, however, because his career comes to quite a sudden end after the height of his success at, Thal uh, at Salamis. But nonetheless, it's, it's, it's a fantastic victory that they, they do achieve at Salamis. Um, they basically rout and destroy the greater part of the Persian Navy, and the Persian Navy is not able to contest the Greeks. Uh, one thing I should mention, because um, I nearly forgot, is that the when they go to the Oracle, um, a part of the Oracle's prediction was that, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, Sparta, the, the Greeks would burn or Sparta would lose a king. And so at the at the culmination of the Battle of Thermopylae, they obviously lose King Leonidas leading his, his Spartans, so they fulfilled that part of the prophecy of, of the Oracle of Delphi. Another point of the Oracle of, of Delphi was that a, a, the Athenian people, not Athens, the Athenian people would be saved by their wooden wall or by their yeah. wall, which was made of wood. And so the Athenians interpret this as we actually have to pull down our wooden wall and build ships out of it. So it was sort of the, the, the Athenian wooden wall was a proverbial wall of ships, which the Athenians made into ships and famously won this this fantastic battle at Salamis. Well, this is um, because um, um, a couple of years before this, um, when, when obviously there was still the threat from the from the Persians and this oracle was made, um, it, it, in the mines of Lorium, which were silver mines not far from Athens, they found a yes. gigantic new vein of silver. And usually they would just, you know, split it up and distribute it to the citizens. But Themistocles, um, using this prophecy from the Delphic Oracle, managed to convince them to build a navy of 200 Correct. triremes with the money. Yep. That's right. So they were adequately prepared for when the the, the threat came, because essentially without those ships, there's really no way the the Greek cities could have, uh, in sufficient time, built up enough naval strength to have contested the sea with the Persians with the essentially an armada that they had at their disposal. Um, the the Persians do. do uh, Xerxes does go back to to Persia. Certainly crosses back over the Hellespont and back into the the 
near recent Asia Minor, but he leaves a general in in Greece to to more or less occupy Attica and mainland Greece, and his name just escapes me. You might have to help me, Columba, if you remember it. Um, but then he's then later. Um, I believe I believe it's Mardonius. Yeah, it is Mardonius. Um, that's right. And um, Mardonius is um, uh, famously slain at the uh, the battle where uh, the so so when the Greeks have withdrawn from when the Greeks have withdrawn from uh, from the Thermopylae and, and the survivors have made it back into the Peloponnese and crossed the Agri Corinth, and the other Greek city states contribute to this new force, and most of it comes from Sparta. The Athenians contribute, uh, the Acadians, the Achaeans, and so on. Um, the the uh, the Persians are confronted by this unified Greek army at the famous Battle of Plataea, and it's actually at Plataea not only did the Greeks destroy or def well they defeat and destroy large parts of the Persian army, they actually kill Mardonius in battle as well. Yes, yeah, so I think that's um, that's that's a wonderful summary you've both given of the um, Great Persian Wars. In terms of what happens after this, um, I think it's fair to say that um, the aftermath or the continuation of the Great Persian War, you know, really up to the um, Peace of Callias in 449 BC, um, could almost be said to continue into the Peloponnesian Wars. And I think I'm going to um, just leave it there for a while and go to my next topic of discussion which is the Greek Golden Age, so the Greece of the 5th century, uh, after this um, major enemy is defeated. And so really, um, just as much as possible, just summarise, you know, why this was cons why this constitutes a Golden Age and what were the achievements of the Greeks, you know, very briefly, because of course there were so many. Um, well, I would say that one of the most important things is, even in the Archaic Era, you know, um, we, are seeing, we are seeing this birth of this... Um, you Sorry, Columba, you've you've cut out again. Very frustrating, you know, wind up in Scotland. Um, Marcus? Well, what I will say is I think this uh, this part of this discussion can be the New well, Greece, um, which has these... Um, oh, you know, no. There you go. He's back. No. Can you start again, oh, Columba? Oh, hello? Hello. <laughs> hello. You're there now. Hello. You're so, out. Sorry, guys. I don't know what's happening. Um, right, so you'll have to start again if that's all right. I, I was I was just going to say that... Um, we in this period is is there there there's to some extent the new Greek culture that is being developed is fragile, you know, and and, and if the Persians had won and had conquered Greece, um, perhaps European civilization as we know it, you know, um, um, all of these important things would have sort of died out, and and, and Greece would have just been a an, an outpost of this um, Oriental Empire. But when this happens. It's almost as if through their victory against the Persians, any last vestiges of this idea of them. You've cut out again. So um, the last vestiges of Greece being, I, I'm trying to anticipate what he's going to say. Um, I think besides, if, yes, Marcus, if you, if you want me to just wax on. Oh, no, he's back. No, he's not. <laughs> uh, I can't win here. I don't know what's going on. Oh, it's, no, this is so tragic. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's their victory puts them in contrast with the Persians. It's a moment of vast self-definition, if you will. Yeah, exactly. It, it definitely um, strengthens this theme of the Greeks in their own eyes. And I think um, this was read. This was written in a book uh, titled From Armageddon to the Fall of Rome. And it's a book written essentially about the major battles of the world from Megiddo fought between the Egyptians and I remember the... Uh, who was it? I can't remember. Anyway, and it ends with the actual fall of Rome in, you know, with the Ostrogoths. And the way that this author described the Greek victory over the Persians, the Salamis and Plataea was... And and starting with Marathon is the birth cry of Europe. And I think that's a really touching way of describing it because Greece under different circumstances and under different conditions could have quite easily have been conquered by Persia and could have found itself brought into the Persian realm in, seen more as a, an outpost of the East rather than as a standard bearer of the West. It could have been just another Persian satrap. It could have been amalgamated to this world of King of Kings. Uh, where they gave the Persian king uh, earth, uh, uh, earth and water. And I think history, certainly that part of the world, but certainly European history more profoundly and more widely spread could have been very, very different as a result of this particular series of battles. And Marathon, uh, Thermopylae, Salamis, 
Plataea a definitive in a a Greek slash Western iteration of Europe that we actually experience today. A yes, a, a distinct civilization from that of the Persianic Asiatic East. Yes, and I think um this is really important to emphasize the you know the achievements during the the golden age um in terms of the again the political history it goes hand in hand with the causes of the peloponnesian wars so we'll leave that out until the end but um mm -hmm. we have you know in terms of the development of the greek language um we as we mentioned we have all the various dialects you know dorian ionian aeolic we have the um it's during this period that we really have the um coalescence of attic greek which is going to be the not only the prestige dialect of the hellenic peoples but you know transitioning into the roman empire and even beyond even to today to some extent you know ancient greek holds this pedigree of being you know the the language associated with the sciences and with intellectualism in terms of you know hellenistic intellectualism of course we mentioned how during the archaic period we had um forerunners of this but of course this really comes to fruition in the classical period so we have you know socrates epicurus um Anastenes, you know, Plato, uh, later on in the Hellenic period, you know, the cross between the Greek and um, the classical period and the Hellenic period, of course, we have Aristotle, we have the, uh, you mentioned already with the um, proliferation of this uniform Greek culture throughout the, um, the polices, you know, all across the Mediterranean, we have the outpouring of, you know, Greek poetry, we have the Greek Odeon, the theatre, we have um, playwriters such as Aristophanes, we have um, the beginning of the Western musical tradition, which begins in Greece. Of course, from my point of view, we have the foundation of academic history, and it's something which we can tangibly no. say is distinct from mythology and theogonic history, such as that of um, the Homeric legends, which is... Yeah, I mean, the, we, um, have, um, we have history under Thucydides the first time, really. And, you know? and Her well, Herodotus, I'd say. I mean, my main source in this, of course, is that um, I, I'm not a classicist. I'm approaching this. Um, my understanding of Collingwood would comes more from the philosophy of history. Nevertheless, um, he places you know, greater emphasis on Herodotus as the first um, unbiased recorder of the sources. And again, his historia in um, Greek just means investigation. Um, yeah, yeah, but I mean, in terms of um, a proper, um, what's the word, academic rigorous historian, Thucydides is pretty much the first. Earth is pretty much just reports every year, you know? Oh, yes, then that is that is the um, the claim always made against him that um, there isn't the the grand narrative construction. Rather, Herodotus will recall things and he won't investigate as to whether those um, sources are true or not. Nevertheless, I think we have the, the beginning of the method in Herodotus. Um, I think Collingwood even sort of tries to appeal to um, there's some sort of weird overlap with um, Hippocrates, of course, being the, the founder of medicine during this period at the same time um, as influencing um, Thucydides' um, the histories, which, of course, you know, we understand as the, the history of the Peloponnesian Wars, even though it wasn't known at the time as the history of the Peloponnesian Wars. It's a later invention. In terms of like, again, other innovations, we have um, mathematics, of course, with um, Pythagoras and Euclid. So really all of this is coalescing at this time. And it, you can say it, you know, thanks to these victories. But um, unless, you know, anyone wants you know to say anything else, of course, you know, I've, I've got on that image, of course, um, oh. the, the image of the Greek Parthenon, which is the, the coalescence, and again, the, the fruition of this incredible um, Greek architecture. And you've already mentioned the influences on sculpture. So I'll let you speak, Marcus. If, no, I was just going to say, if one thing does pop into our mind, it's that the, we, we sort of have to be a little bit disciplined because I think between the three of us, we could, we could go on for ad infinitum about this, but one thing I really want to try and conceptualize in a short space of time is just the profound impact that Greek culture and Greek history and this sort of period between this sort of Spartan Athenian ascendancy and you might say the the disintegration of the Diadochi, you know, a, a couple of centuries later, is the impact this has on people who long haven't been born before you know uh, uh, subsequent after this period you got to think that the the one of the main uh one of the main inspirations for support for the greek war of independence in the in in the 1820s 830s against the ottoman empire was this rebirth of greek classicism in france and in england and the fact that these are uh, these writers, you know, most famously Lord Byron, who died at the siege of Mussolini um, during the re revolution, they draw on this history. Uh, they draw upon this literature of, of the Greek, classical Greek world, and they're inspired by it, and it, it greatly impacts their work, and it impacts their worldview to a very, very profound degree. 
consider also that even in the modern context, for those of us who do appreciate classics and do like, uh, you know, this subject immensely, think that even Aesop's poetry, which maybe Aesop himself might not have considered particularly remarkable, but even his fables today ring true to anyone trying to pass a, a moral lesson onto a relative or a, or a child or something. And you know, we talk about the golden goose, for instance. I mean, that is a conception of of Greek mm. thinking, of, of of the Greek outlook of the world, and it has gone them. into the two thousands. And it's such, and and, and, and we got to appreciate how 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 deep that is in our psyche and how far back in history that impact has had on us today it's a it's amazing if you think yeah about i mean it. in terms of um i assume you've mentioned philosophy before the wind killed me there but i mean you know you, you people like thales and miletus and and even pythagoras i mean you know it, you have mathematics and physics really um you know which are of course Absolutely. very powerful very powerful things but if you look at um, um classical athens you see the birth of moral philosophy with Socrates, and then with Aristotle, the birth of metaphysics. Uh, yeah. You know, you know, not no longer a question of um, what is that. You know, what, what, why, what, um, how, how, what is it being? It's, it's. You're, you're asking. You know, what is being? You know, you're getting into these, the, the, these deep issues about the nature of reality itself and and how to live well. Um, and and, and these things just have a, a, yeah, a profound impact. And also, um, also, you might describe few, it as, as, as the first insights as to people asking about the nature of the universe itself. Yeah, it is. It is, and not and just, it, and, and not just. Being. Uh, and not just in a matter of fact sort of physical way, although of course the mm. Greeks that originated with them as well. But I mean, oh. yeah, in, in, ter in terms of the development of, um, of 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 logos and reason, um, these things would have a profound impact also on um, Christendom. You know, which I mean, at the end of the day, the Christian the Christianity is 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 a synthesis of this Greek world with with the East. You know, um, and they say that Christi Christianity is like three parts Roman, Greek, and Semitic. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I think in terms of um, if you're talking particularly about the, the you know the, the one true church, you know, I mean it's 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 it takes all the best parts of Roman statecraft, Greek philosophy, and Jewish religious truth, you know. But um, yeah, I mean, I mean, w without without this period and without the visceral reaction against the Persians, we might never have had um a conception of the West, you know. Yes, quite. So thank you for that. Uh, again, I just wanted to provide because the, the depressing thing about this and the nature of this overview stream is that um, trying to confine, you can almost say the, the greater part of classics in a single, what will probably be in you know, a two and a half hour stream, is never going to do justice to this. And we can do a heterodox episode on any one of these figures that you've mentioned, Columba. So we are, you know, just trying to give an overview as to the extent and really the significance and the legacy of these ideas moving forward as we catalogue, you know, Greek history in particular, but also the history of orthodoxy on this series. So from that point of view, I'll move on to the Peloponnesian War. And um, in terms of starting this, I'm going to start this back at the chronology of the, um, of the end of the first um, Greco-Persian War. Um, because there is one event I believe which is which is significant, which is the accusation of treachery against um, Parsenius. Um, after the Battle of Plataea, um, the Greeks, of course, were casually liberating, you know, most of the um, the cities which had been conquered in Thrace and um, uh, in Thrace and Macedon, um, in particular Byzantium. Now, as far as I'm aware, Parsenius had been one of the great generals of the Battle of Plataea. And um, at this time, also, the Ionians were um, fighting for their independence at the same time, which, of course, was the, the beginning of this conflict, was the Ionian revolt. Um, how significant was this in the sense that Sparta would withdraw as the leader of this anti-Persian revolt, and instead it would be Athens, you know, the victors of Salamis, which would you know, come to fruition as the Delian League and would continue to fight against the Persians, really, for the next 40 years? Well, I think a part of this can be answered in the way that the Greek, the Greek, the in, in which the Athenian system was assembled, and some of the, in some ways, genius, in other ways, the seed of its destruction was sort of sowed in this design. But with the the Delian League, it was called that because the treasury of the Delian League was originally held in De Delos, the island Delios, uh, which is uh, just near Paros on that map. Um, and uh, hence the name of the league it was uh that was the center of its treasury but many of its members 
obviously including Athens, thought that it would be difficult to defend because uh, Delios had a very small army because of its population and a small navy of its own right. So the treasure was relocated to Athens in the reconstructed um, Acropolis following the, the, the Persian War and the, the reconstruction of Athens and the, uh, the reassembly of the state. Um, and Athens originally orchestrated this alliance by forming uh, an alliance of sea-going sort of Thales the Thalassocratic uh, island states and incorporating their navies within the Athenian navy. And then the Athenians conceived the policy of for, for, for states that couldn't contribute a navy, rather pay a tithe into the alliance in lieu of ships. The Athenians worked out this was rather lucrative. So then over a period of maybe a decade, this basically changed into just a tithe paying uh, exercise to the Athenian state. And yes. it sort of became more a, 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 more a position of Athenian vassals in the Aegean rather than Athenian allies. So there's a little bit of discontent by the time the Pel Peloponnesian Wars are, are, are just sort of breaking out. Absolutely. And just and just um, talking about, again, the, the very nature of the Peloponnesian Wars, I believe it is, you know, sown at that time of Greece, um, of Greece being led by the, the Athenians as opposed to the Spartans, despite the incredibly significant role played by both factions. Uh, I think what you're mentioning is this, this idea of um, Pentecontatetia, which is this um, creation of an Athenian empire and this transition from a federation. And as we can see from the map, very much a federation of um, Anatolian city-states into a tributary network and yeah. a means of sustaining not only the Athenian economy through the massive trade, but also the Athenian navy at the same time. The Athenian navy being, being again, the bastion of the power and again, the ultimate source of its demise is through this over-reliance on the league system itself. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, you know, moving on from the chronology, um, the Greeks continue to drive the Persians out of Western Anatolia all the way up until um, 466, when I believe you know, virtually all of the Ionian city-states, and as you can see from that map, um, the Greeks have reconquered vast amounts of territory from the Persians as a result of this defeat by the Persians. Um, you know, what really checks it, on the one hand, it's um, the Greeks failing to capitalize off the success of a revolt in Egypt, which results in um, um, Persian rule being restored in Egypt. And again, you know, Egyptian revolts are, you know, a perennial problem and they'll be seized on by Alexander the Great much later on. Um, but also we have the first sort of major scuffle with Sparta at the same time, which is, you know, 30 years or so before the Peloponnesian War in earnest. And, you know, the dates of that are 431 to um, 404 BC. Um, and this is because Athens, in addition to having its own massive sphere of influence across the Aegean Sea, mainly focusing on the maintenance, maintenance, maintenance of a navy, um, we have Athens trying to bring, I believe in 459, they try and bring um, Megara, which had traditionally been a Spartan ally in the Peloponnese, onto its side. And um, as a result, this spawns conflict. You could almost say it's the first Peloponnesian War before the Peloponnesian Wars began. And so in 446, you have the declaration of a 30 years peace, um, which returns Megara to the Spartan sphere of influence, but sort of again trying to um, understand why the Spartans were liable again to want to attack the Greek and um, attack the Athenians in earnest. Um, because I, I do believe they're very justified, and there is this justification that the Athenians are empire builders essentially, and well, they're trying I mean, to. Didn't didn't the I mean the Spartans had their own their own land based league? Oh, exactly, right? they had their own land based empire, and um, but the, I think believe that the the issue is that the um, Athenians were trying to undermine, especially Corinth and Megara in particular, which were you know Spartans' main allies, and had they undermined those allies. Um, you know, Sparta would have been completely isolated, you know, way down south in the, the bottom of the Peloponnese. Um, and, um, and I just, one, one point I would note is because the Spartan power is land-based, right? And yes. The Spartans are the preeminent um, hoplite warriors in the world. You know, they're the best. Yes. And, 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 the, and, the, and the, the Athenians are running this naval empire. And one of the best um, examples of, of um, just how insufficient the Athenians were in terms of land power is um, the Athenian city was, you know, Athens is some, some some way off from the coast, and the coastal port of Athens was called Piraeus. Now, in this period, um, with their new wealth from the League, the Athenians actually constructed what get called the Long Walls. So you had walls around 
Athens, the city, and then very two very long walls all the way to the port of Piraeus, you know? And so it shows, you know, they didn't have any land forces. All they have is their navy. And so, well, how do we defend our city? We'll just build a really long wall to the port, you know? So that gives you an idea of just the, the imbalance there. Well, I think also the creation of the walls in themselves was a, um, a source of frustration for... Um, for the for for not you know Athens's former allies because they believed it was almost like a hostile intent against the you know nascent alliance which had been created by the um, Peloponnese Wars. Um, again, moving move, moving on from this, um, well, just just very quickly, I am, another thing to point out is that if, considering that Sparta and Athens are not that far apart, control of the is Isthmus of Corinth was always going to be of strategic importance for either party, Absolutely. and whilst Megara and Corinth were aligned with Sparta, they'd always have the 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 proverbial uh, pistol held to the to the head of the Athenian yes, league absolutely. at Athens, and by Athens trying to bring Megara to its side was it basically attempting to uh, 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 reinforce its weakness against Sparta. Oh, I, I don't land. I don't disagree with any yeah. of these things. Nevertheless, no, I'm, I think just, I'm just highlighting that for the oh, audience. Yes, yes, I, again, realize that. Um, yes I, but I do I do believe therefore it is the delineation into these two opposing spheres of influence, and you can almost say it's Cold War politics in a sense that. Um, Athens is trying to undermine the alliances of the alliance of Sparta. Um, in terms of like Corinth in particular, um, I, I, I believe that um, Athens goes after one of um, Corinth's, the city of Corinth's um, nominal vassals, and tries to disassociate it from all sort of Corinthian influence. And um, that and the sanctions which were imposed on Megara, which again could have um, seriously damaged the economy, of course, um, Athens being the center of the economy. You can say that um, the Spartans were actually taking a very lax um, approach to the Athenians during all of this. And it was actually the Corinthians, the Megarans, especially the Corinthians, who were egging the Spartans on to honor their commitments to the League and declare war on Athens as a result of all these provocations against their own, you know, respective spheres of influence. So it wasn't just, you know, Sparta against Athens, but very much Sparta's allies trying to rely on the power of Sparta itself Certainly, to defend them. Yeah. This is something that you see a lot. The Spartans are, I guess, what we might call quite isolationist, you know? They 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 they're they're not they're not particularly fond of conquest until um until actually until this war ends you know and then we see um, um the spartans beginning to be a bit more aggressive but before that yeah there's no there's no real um conquests um or or i mean you have their league but that, that that's really about it the spartans seem to have this um tendency to keep to themselves yes and the league is amazing wall it's very much a defensive alliance isn't it yes absolutely a very much a defensive alliance and very much declaring again the peloponnese as an area which is off limits to the athenians so in response to this um in 432 the, the spartan assembly declares war again at the behest principally of the corinthians and um again in terms of this reluctance to actually engage in conquest this is marked by the the first phase of the war from 431 until 21 whereby um the Spartans, whenever they, because again, they have basically free reign over Attica during this period, you know, the considerable landholding of the Athenians, because the Athenians principally have the power on sea. And I've got an image of Pericles up there, um, one of the most, probably the most famous strategos of um, the Athenian democracy at this point, who basically launched a conservative strategy of, you know, holding on to naval supremacy and defending the city from sea and establishing that supremacy whilst um, not really taking the war to the Spartans at all. So what the Spartans did, I believe, is that they would occupy large parts of Attica only for a few weeks. I think the longest period of occupation was about um, about four weeks, sorry, about five weeks. Um, principally, not only do they not want to conquer the regions, because it was, you know, principally a defensive war, but also they were always concerned about helot uprisings and having the um, Spartan military, again, looking at the map, Sparta is you know, quite a long way from Attica. Um, having the army so far away would possibly result in a helot uprising fomented by the Athenians themselves. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point to consider. I mean, because um, for, for, for people who are listening who might not know, I mean, the Halot class massively outnumbered the, uh, the, the Spartan aristocracy. And, and in order for the Spartans to dominate them, they basically had to constantly and ruthlessly persecute the Halots and, and run a sort of um, almost a terror campaign. I mean, when, when, a, when a young Spartan man 
um, as a rite of passage. He had to go out at night with a knife and murder a halo, you know. And so there was just there was this yeah this this um this 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 terror. And if if the Spartans were away for too long, then all hell would break loose. For for those for those uh, not so well understanding of the subject, you could almost equivocate the uh, the position of the halots in in Sparta and to the the attitudes of the Lacedaemonians to their neighbours, very much in the way like the modern Chinese sort of treat the Uyghurs. You know, it's very much a second class citizenry that are used for the most. I mean, I tasks. I would you rather know. be a Uyghur in China than a Halo in Lacedaemon. <laughs> but, well, but you know, I yes, suppose but, you know it depends. It's just uh, an analogy. I thought that would was fitting for the description. Yes, yeah, so I try and steer this away from current events, if that's all right. Um, but but again, th I understand that. Hopefully, the audience will appreciate the analogy. Um, of course, Pericles, you know, dies quite early in the war. I believe he dies in um three two nine, sorry, four two nine, BC, and he's replaced I, by um. Uh, I think he dies during the plague, does he not? He, oh well, yes, there is a massive plague. plague. He's a yes, there is a massive plague during this point, and I believe yes. it um kills about a third of the population of Athens, you know, and again, in terms of the manpower for the Navy of Athens, yeah, this is completely debilitating. Or, although, you know, it really doesn't, it, as far as I'm aware, unless I'm reading this wrong, it doesn't seem to have affected the Athenian strategy at all, if anything, you know, when Pericles dies um, with Cleon and Demosthenes, um, we have a complete reappraisal of the strategy and the Athenians begin to wave, um, wage a much more aggressive war against the Spartans. You know, they begin to um, raid the coastlines, the Peloponnese, and they also um, engage them at the battles of um, Pylos and um, Sacticaria. But this is also um, this is also their great downfall, right? Because Pericles, Pericles had sort of he was you know a great statesman in the democracy, and he had basically he was basically a sort of primus inter pares, you know, a first among equals, you know, who who unofficially ruled the democratic state. Yes, I believe he and, was elected um, 10 times to a yeah, position which yeah. he couldn't hold consecutively. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he just sort well, of broke the rules, right? But once yeah. he was gone, what ends up happening is that um, Athenian policy is basically uh, thrown to the democracy, if you will, and the demo and the chaotic democracy yeah. takes over, and then we have the Sicilian expedition. Oh, well, that's that's quite a lot after, um, quite a, quite a long time afterwards. But yes, it is. It is very much. I would agree completely with your assessment that it is the response of a democracy fighting a war. And again, you can see this in the the First World War. You know, the the war to total victory. There isn't this some um, priestly a, a priestly element. Uh, sorry, a princely element that you see with many of the wars of the eighteenth century. In particular, the moderating moderating influence. Yes, are, are, are gone with Pericles. And the thing is the successes of both parties because you in in athens at this point of time there's essentially a peace party that's being led by a, a, a man by the name of nikios um, oh, yes. who actually ironically ends up leading the sicilian expedition oh yes oh, I'm about, I'm and, about to get there yeah and, um, and and on the other side you have uh, uh, uh cleon who is a, is a warhawk and uh and i believe one of i don't know if it's cleon or if it's someone else from the warhawk party actually dies outside the walls of the oh, siege yes. of amphipoly because oh, yes. what's actually both happening is both, both the what's and cleon die at the um die at the battle of amphipoly and again in the terms of the significance of that battle um it had been again temporarily conquered by the um, peloponnesian league and i believe this city I, i'm not looking at the map but i believe the city is um somewhere around thrace and um, this was um, it's just on it's just on the edge of the Ch the Ch Ch Chalcadica Peninsula. Yes, just, uh, and um, this was the main source of Athenian silver. And this battle could be considered the the end of the first phase of the war and the ascension of um, Nicias, as you mentioned. And, and as uh, for so much as the Athenians are sort of huddling behind their walls against the Spartans not engaging them in the field in Attica specifically, Amphipoli is their one offensive action during this early passive phase. Yes, exactly. So um, going back from there, we have the 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 piece of um, Nicias, and I, I think it's Im important to note that he, he, within this period, um, the Sparta is also trying to reconsolidate its control of the Peloponnesian League, and this is basically achieved at the um, Battle of Mantinea, um, whereby again they defeat the Athenians and they're able to reassert their hegemony over the cities of Corinth and Megara, but. Um, in terms of the bringing this back to the Sicilian ex, uh, sorry, the Sicilian expedition which you mentioned, um, would you like to elaborate more on that? Because it's you know re, you can say it's really destructive to the um, the fortunes of Athens. Um, as as far as I know, it was the uh, it was the brainchild of Alcibiades, right? Alcibiades, who was later, I, I believe, he was 
considered a traitor and one of the um things twice that was over. you know twice over he one had, of the uh, he had quite a life yeah <laughs> yes yeah, one of the considerations before he went on to the expedition was he wanted to stand trial just so you know just before he could make his case but regardless he was sent on this expedition and um i, I believe he was quickly relieved of um duty and he was as you said you know replaced by um uh Nikias. and um not only was this a massive un undertaking by the Athenians, I believe they had hundreds of ships um, engaged on this expedition to conquer Sicily. You know, why Sicily? Well, there had been a casus belli provided by the fact that the, Syrac the city of Syracuse had um, attacked a, I, I believe it was a Ionian policy. I can't, I can't remember which one. And of course, I think, this. I think it was Catania, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. It could be Catania. Uh, and this, um, as we mentioned, the significance of ethnos within the, the fundamental creation of the League, um, I believe Sy Syracuse was Dorian, you know, just like um, just like Sparta. And right. so this provided a casus belli to take over, as we mentioned, um, Sicily and Magna Graecia were, you know, some of the richest areas in terms of the density of Greek colonies during this period. So Greek, you know, rule over Syracuse could have massively expanded the empire. So it made sense from a, and again, it also would have undermined the Spartans as well from the Western flank. So there were a lot of um, good reasons to attack. Nevertheless, the Athenians were annihilated by this, not least because the Sicilians had incredibly effective Tarotine cavalry, which, you know, continually defeated the Athenians on land. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and again, it's also just it's also just um, um, quite quite chaotic. I mean, when you when you see when you see the Athenians have their successes, it's always because it's very clear who's in charge. But at this time, like we like you say, things are very chaotic, you know, and the the democracy has gone has gone kind of off the rails. I mean, you know, for, to have someone like Alcibiades leading an expedition like this shows you how. Um, image obsessed and sort of um 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 ridiculous the situation had become i mean alcibiades used to you know strut through the agora in athens you know with a, a you know like a 20 feet long purple cloak with ostrich feathers on it and stuff you know he was just he was the most eccentric <laughs> sort of literal, crazy character literal peacocking throughout yes yeah, literal <laughs> peacocking but um, but the, but the problem is in a democracy people like that are popular the, the thing to consider too is, um, you know, I suppose those of us in our circles who, who have the worldview that we do, there's a very interesting uh, uh, appraisal here of democracy and how it functions in that the initial proposal for the Sicilian expedition was only meant to be 60 ships. And the... the oh, yeah, party, mission oh, creep, oh, yeah. Well, the thing is, they didn't want the Warhawks to lead it. The 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 peace the Dove Party said led, led by Nikia said we will support a large expedition if we lead it. Now I don't know if Alcibiades ever was commander of it. I know he was a part of the expedition at least initially, but I'm pretty sure Nikias was always the commander of it once the uh, uh, the fleet was assembled and the the force was brought together. Now the thing is, being a Dove and being of a, a, a non military background, Nikias had really no idea of what he was doing, and he was only measurably successful in the early part of the campaign because of his advisors one of whom his best advisor and his name just escapes me at the minute actually dies outside the walls of syracuse during the sort of the on and off siege the worst thing is not only is the size of the expedition doubled initially it is then reinforced with a further i think 150 ships this ends up being a monumental expedition absolutely in post plague athens not only and that it takes you know it takes place over the course of two years as well it's yes. a, um, an incredibly long drawn out campaign exactly and 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 the and the uh, we sort of touched last week i sort of but when we talk about the the, the lombards and i sort of made that analogy about being spread out and if you're spread out you actually have to have one because you're most vulnerable what the athenians don't do is they don't actually destroy the syracusan navy and once sparta cottons onto the strategy actually sends a relieving navy to relieve Syracuse and breaks the the naval blockade. And this is where the campaign in Sicily starts to really go wrong for Athens in a very comprehensive way. Yeah, and, and Athens also loses its sort of authority. You know what I mean? It loses the, the, the sort of 
um, fear of its navy, you know, amongst the other amongst the other groups at this time because they've just had this massive disaster, you know. Absolutely, Correct. and this is this is why I was so again conscious to tie this into the continuity of the um, Greco Persian War, because this is where this um, idea of you know on the one hand we had at the beginning with the Ionian Revolt, Greek interference in Persian affairs. Now we're going to have Persian interference in Greek affairs. With the final phase of the war, which lasts from about four three uh, four thirteen until you know four oh four BC, the um, Decalean War. Um, Persia intervenes on the side of Sparta, and principally, this is as we see with the map, um, Athens is an incredibly precarious position in terms of suffering a Persian intervention because of the nature of the vast majority of their Ionian allies, of course, are vulnerable to Persia, but also they are responsible for sustaining not only the tributary system, but also the naval supremacy of Athens. As you mentioned, that's already begun to come apart as a result of this major blow in the form of the um, Sicilian campaign. So all and of also, these... And also just due to the to the situation in Attica, also their food supply. Absolutely, yeah. So all of Sorry, these facts... No, no, it's, it's an important point to make. All of these factors combine all at the same time. The fact that um, the the alliances are being damaged, um, Athens has been, you know, again over overly imperialistic in its uh, attempt to confederate all these uh, en entities into basically an uh, like a vassal system, essentially, rather than an alliance of uh, an alliance of equals. And so, all of these um, compounding issues: the fact that Sparta is reconsolidating, the fact that Athens has made too many um, unforced errors partly as a result of its um, political system, results in Sparta being able to significantly undermine and defeat Athens in that sea, which again should demonstrate really how the tide has turned during this um, 25 years war at this point. And it is the Navarch Lysander who defeats the Athenians at the Battle of um, Ego um, Egospotomy. And um, the year after this, um, again, the symbolic element of um, Athens's defeat, the walls are um, demolished on the orders of Lysander in 404. Yeah, the long but, walls, which I mentioned. Yeah. Absolutely, to make the city, you know, com again, completely vulnerable to the land element, which is the crux of the Spartan Empire, but also the Athenian democracy, which had, you, you could almost say that the Spartans were right in their assessment that the Athenian democracy was a fundamentally aggressive political system. And so they abolished the political system, again, where the cities of Corinth in particular wanted Athens to be destroyed. The Spartans instead opted for a system whereby they would impose an oligarchic regime, namely the regime of 30 tyrants, yeah. which would rule in Athens for a year. It's quite admirable, I suppose. Like, I mean, the other allies, like you mentioned, like Corinth and I believe Thebes, they, they were yes. literally calling for the enslavement of all of the Athenians. You know? And the destruction Attica, of the city. Attica yeah. Delenda Est. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's, it's quite significant because really we see the Peloponnesian Wars is the destruction of this Athenian Empire, which had been built up in the classical golden age of Greece. And I think we're, it's now time to the point where we um, talk about the, the effects of the war on, you know, Greece in general. You know, we, we start the fifth century with a, with a major, you know, almost apocalyptic event and we end the fifth century with this apocalyptic event in the form of the, the culmination of the Peloponnese War. And as far as I'm aware, this war led, you know, to among other things, a major depopulation and, you know, disunity within the Greek camp. And also, I think it's important oh, yeah. to note that the scale of warfare as a result of the Peloponnesian War, Peloponnesian war was also massively ramped up. So were the atrocities at the same time. And the worst thing is that the Spartan victory wasn't total either. It wasn't a case of, you know, there was temporarily a case where the Spartans almost established a hegemony over Greece, but never to the same extent that the, Af the Athenians had with the Delian League. And very quickly, the Greek system, the 30 tyrants, was overthrown and quickly replaced with democracy. Um, hence why we have, you know, the image of, you know, Socrates being killed, you know, for, uh, I believe it's um, corrupting the minds of the youth as the official crime for the, for the murder of Socrates. And this happens after the, um, the fall of Athens in the um, Peloponnesian War. But we also have, sorry, sorry, I just, last point before I'm, I'll let you speak, Marcus. We also have the, you can say the immediate undermining of the Spartan hegemony by the Corinthian War. And by 371 BC, it is now Thebes after the Battle of Lutra, which becomes the temporary hegemon over the next um, 40 or so years before the arrival of the Macedonians.
Yeah, yeah, under um, Epaminondas, I believe, is the one who leads the Thebans to victory over the Spartans. Hmm. The, yeah, and the thing too is if, if we consider the, the position of Athens at this point, the, the, Athenian, uh, the, the Athenian expedition to Sicily has approximately cost 35 to 40,000 lives. They've lost the order, something in the order of 150 to 200 ships. Nikias actually, I don't think he's in fact slain. I think he actually dies of cancer because actually by the time he's, he's sent to Sicily, he's dying of cancer unbeknowingly. But the entire expedition is killed to a man. The, the, the remainder of, once they disengage the siege of, of Syracuse, the Greek, the Athenians try and march north up to their allies up near um, Monday Messina and Talmina. But they're killed by the, the, the Syracuse and Spartan alliance who also um, utilize the, the allegiance of the native Sicilians to their advantage. And the, the, the Athenian expedition is killed to a man, quite literally. It's entirely destroyed. The Athenians do partially recover at sea. Uh, they actually fight a number of quite desperate sea battles, some under the command of Alcibiades in his second career. Um, and then uh, they had, um, I think, two or three uh, naval commanders at this point who did successfully sort into the Aegean. But there was quite a controversy, and I actually can't recall the name of the battle at the moment, but the Athenians actually, due to an oracle and a storm, don't recover their lost sailors at sea. And then when they sail back into Athens, all of the Athenian leaders of this navy are executed. And yep. then Lysander is successful in destroying this last navy. And so between all the losses in the Aegean battles and the Sicilian expedition, Athens is absolutely exhausted. And this leaves Sparta, the undisputed hegemon of Greece. Yeah, and that, and, and it's um, it's after this um that sparta begins to get much more aggressive and of course the spartans had enlisted persian help now once the spartans are dominant in greece and i suppose maybe they don't have the same kind of fears about the halots and all these problems yeah. with the Athenians. they go on the uh, um, um on the attack um under their king agisalaus and they actually um invade um, the Persian Empire, <laughs> like, yeah. with you know, right. like, like something like ten thousand Spartans, and they just they just cause cause havoc throughout Anatolia. Um, yeah, yeah, which is which is one of my favorite periods. Um, Agesilaus is an interesting one. You know, apparently he was quite short and had a club foot, but he was uh, all the Spartans adored him because he was um he, he was he was very intelligent. You know, a, a great general. But um, yeah, yeah, and they 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 begin sort of raiding and making inroads, and this is very important because I mean, you know, the Athenians had sort of with their naval victory had liberated the Ionian cities but the idea of you know striking deep into you know the heart of Anatolia and taking the fight to the Persians I would say pretty much um that really gets kicked off with Agisalaus and the Spartans and then exactly. obviously um yeah those successes are only built on by um the Alexander you know exactly well thank but, you but, but, oh, Sorry, I was just gonna say and essentially Athens never recovers after this there no. is there, uh, the, there are little sort of sparks of semi-recovery, but Athens will never be the same again in history as a standalone power. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much for that, guys. We'll move on to the um, the last sort of main chronological event, which, of course, are the Wars of Alexander the Great. Um, but, of course, before we get to the actual chronology of the wars, we have to deal with the fact of um, Macedon arri um, uh, arriving on the scene and... Um, being again an awkward position where the Greeks are now being led by what was previously considered to be a barbarian kingdom. And just um, to give like a quick summary of the, the Macedonians, uh, again, in terms of their geography, their modern day, you know, not the modern day state of North Macedonia, they're in the area around um, Thessaloniki, which I, I believe in Greek, it means um, a friend of Thessalay, which was a city established by Philip II which was to commemorate his new um, hegemonship over Thessaly. And again, this is something quite significant with Philip II, his diplomatic career. But you know, going, uh, going before then, I, I, believe, um, I believe it was either Thucydides or Herodotus who said that the Macedonians were a barbarian nation being ruled by a Greek dynasty, and that Greek dynasty being the Argeats, who of course um, uh, claim um, descent from the, um, the city of Argos. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think um, that's what the sources say, right? And I'm pretty sure, um, 
Um, it might have been Alexander himself or a member of his family. They competed in the um, the Isthmian and Olympic Games, you know, yes. which, only, which only Greeks could compete in at this period. Yes, but I think there's you know some controversy as to whether how um, Hellenized the the Macedonians were at this point. As we mentioned, um, during the Greco Persian Wars, they of course had were forced to switch sides and briefly become satrapies of the. Um, of the Archimanid Empire. Um, nevertheless, I think it's safe to say that the Argea dynasty were certainly Greeks. And um, this is where, you know, entering this disaster, the, the disaster of the Peloponnese War and the um, the humbling of um, Athens and the, the weakened hegemony of Sparta, which is quickly shattered by um, the Theban hegemony. Mm -hmm. We have the arrival of this, you know, relative outsider, Philip II, with his newly organized army, which has a strong cavalry corps, which will be the um, the heteratio, or the, you know, the companion cavalry. Um, in addition to his new innovations, you know, moving on from the hoplites to the, um, to the, the new phalanx. pike formations, the new, um, yeah. I believe it's Larissa Pike formations, which are much longer and so much more deadly against cavalry. And um, the first sort of use of combined tactics between cavalry and infantry at the same time. But in addition to the you know the military innovations, I, I, I believe he also goes on campaigns to the north against the um, the Illyrians and um, the Thracians. And uh, as we mentioned, again, the, the Illyrians and the Thracians are going to be uh, present throughout this entire period of Greek history, you know, principally as mercenaries at the same time. And I believe in Thracia there is the um, Odorician kingdom at, the, at this time, or maybe that's a bit later. But um, but nevertheless, he establishes himself as the hegemon of Thessaly. And from that position, um, he, again, you can probably explain it much better, but just to give a very brief overview, um, he is able to, you know, through a combination of guile and also pure military strength, um, establish the League of Corinth with himself as hegemon of all of Greece. And this culminates at the um, the Battle of um, Chironea, um, when the Federation is able to usurp the position of Thebes as, you know, the Greek hegemon. And explicitly the position of Philip II is to be a commander of chief, and as you mentioned with the Spartan expedition, um, uh, Columba, there's this idea that the Greeks are now going to take the offensive deep into Anatolia. And mm. so this confederation is established explicitly on the idea that Philip II will lead the Greeks united with, ironically, the exception of Crete and Sparta, who yeah, do not join the League of Corinth. Yeah, we, 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 might say that, um, we might say that the 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 primary legitimizing factor that the you know the 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 particular hegemon who's in power at the time used in this period was um yeah defending against the persians or attacking the persians that was the primary way of justifying your rule over over the greeks because that's how um rule over all the greeks and, and organized greece as a whole had been established in the first place it was all Indeed, the, news, the you know? as the delian league yeah yeah uh marcus do you have anything because again i've been very brief trying to um well, I think we'll need to be, to be honest. Yes, no, we're already no, no, way no. over two hours. <laughs> no, no, I um, I don't really have a lot to add. Uh, aside from the fact that I'm pretty sure Philip comes to the throne um, because his brother dies fighting the Illyrians. So the the Macedonians have quite this fraught relationship between their more their more barbaric neighbours to the north and their sort of more in commas Greek or Hellenized ancestors to their south. It's sort of an in-between society in that respect. Yes, it's relatively remarkable. I think he comes to the position of um, King of Macedon when it's at its weakest and um, threatened on all sides. And within 20 years, from 359 to 36, uh, 336, he's able to um, completely um, restore the fortunes and take Macedon from this, you know, backwater to the principal power in Greece, which is, you know, really quite remarkable. Nevertheless, he dies in 336, um, assassinated by one of his um, bodyguards. And again, still, we don't know conclusively as to why the bodyguard did it. Um, my preferred theory is that um, he was murdered um, by, on the orders of Alexander's mother. So Olympias. that, um, yes, yeah, yeah. so Olympia, so that Alexander could um, inherit, because of course, um, the Macedonians also practiced polygamy. So um, he had other wives at the same time. So. Um, probably moving again from sorry yes and just on philip we have to just briefly mention that he's the man responsible for creating arguably the first truly professional uh, uh, army in certainly in european history you know the 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 organization of the macedonian phalanx or the pesatiroi and his uh and his creation of several subunits you meant you touched on it briefly saying it was the first combined arms force but we cannot we cannot ignore emphasize that it's a truly first 
centralized professional force rather than just being like a a collection of of citizen hoplites led by archons this is a truly professional centralized army absolutely yeah. and you can say that ironically this is a complete reversal of all of the trends we've seen since the mycenaeans and this is the return to a more centralized form of administration you know going back to that period as we're going to see um with the period of Diadocian in particular, we're going to see a massive restoration of the, the ancient system of monarchy throughout Greece. And this really consult consolidates with Philip, but far more so under Alexander because of the certain decisions he's going to make. So we'll get to that. Um, Alexander is you know, thrust into power. I think he's only 17 or 18 when he um, becomes king of um, Macedon and the inheritor of this position as hegemon of all the Greeks with the exception of Sparta. And um, the, Theb the Thebans, believing again that um, this has thrown the Macedonian monarchy into turmoil, revolt. And in response to this, Alexander, you know, brutally consolidates the campaigns of his father by raising the city of Thebes to the ground. Um, and this allows him to, again, begin his father's work in earnest and invade Anatolia. Yeah. And he does this um, in 334 BC, first of all, with the, um, the Battle of Granicus River. Um, but it's really consolidated in a year later with the Battle of Issus, where he's able to es essentially Issus conquers Anatolia as a province away from the Achaemenid Empire. Yeah, and, and he this... captures he captures um, the king Darius's um, his mother and other members of the family. Yeah, yeah. Even though yeah. Darius himself escapes, and you know, will continue to fight on. And whereas in the Battle of the Granicus, Darius wasn't there. Whereas, you know, Correct. in this battle, the Persian king is there and yes, he is defeated, is. you know. Yes. And, and he abandons his troops uh, when the battle turns. Um, sorry, go on, Aim. Oh, no, sorry. Again, just um, with time constraints and everything, we can't be as detailed as probably we'd like to be. But um, um, he moves on, and you mentioned, again, the source of um, Persian naval strength was in their Phoenician navy. Um, he takes on, again, the twin cities of Tyre. There isn't just the land-based city, but he spends almost a year besieging the um, the walled city of Tyre, which is basically kind of like Venice. It's, um, it's a floating city. And after taking over control of you know, modern-day Lebanon, but really the Levant, um, he is welcomed into Egypt. And again, this is building on the fact that um, the Egyptians consistently rebel against Persian rule for a myriad of reasons. And it is in Egypt where I believe um, Alexander either earnestly or cynically takes the decision that almost built, I think this is also an idea inculcated from his mother, Olympias, as well, that Alexander is now the son of Zeus Amon, that he is, yeah, he is himself a divine. There is an oracle um, in the Western Oasis in Egypt, the Oracle of Amon, and Alexander um crosses across the desert to the oasis to go and speak to them and the priests come out and they hail him as the son of amon who's who's yeah like um, the state god of egypt sort of equivalent to zeus yeah and alexander had reportedly been brought up with um you know apparently um alexander's mother olympias and the year before he was born she dreamt that you know a, a thunderbolt struck her womb and and things like mm -hmm. this you know? um and and so you, yeah you see this um the, 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 this this part of Alexander's and not only his image but judging from his actions really his own beliefs you know he he, he I mean and, and you know one can understand how you know given his achievements he, he begins to really believe this you know but um yeah you can see how you know I mean he's conquered Egypt Anatolia the Persian Empire well, <laughs> was, again we'll, we'll only go from this point um he also, as you mentioned, going all the way back to the original Greek colonies, um, he builds on that and founds the city of Alexandria, which will become crucial for understanding, you know, the brief glimpse of the Hellen Hellenistic period, which we're going to go into after this. But um, after the conquest of Egypt, um, we have the Battle of Gargamela, which is um, a modern day sort of a Kurdistan region. And it is at this battle where he convincingly defeats the um, Persian armies, even though still it would take a while for him to, um, again, again, Darius evades capture. And I believe Darius III isn't actually captured by Alexander, but he is killed and betrayed by his own men. He is. He's and, betrayed by Bessus, I think. Mm -hmm. And Alexander is apparently 
um, incensed at this, you know, that he's been, you know, stabbed in the back by his own men. He thinks it's unworthy for a king to, you know. Well, it's going to be, it's going to be a consistent theme, isn't it, among the Greeks? Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't at least have to have Bessus killed as a result of this? Yes, yes, he hunts Bessus so to the ends of the know? earth. Yeah, yes. yeah, because Bessus hopes that he'll, uh, you know, take him on as a satrap, and Alexander just thinks that he's the most vile, you know, thing on earth, and. Mm. Well I, well, I can under, well, I, well, I can understand, again, this, this idea of betraying your liege in order for favours to serve a, a foreign power. And, and again, this is... Alexander is interesting in the sense that this isn't a Macedonian or Greek conquest, so to speak. I do believe that he is trying to position himself as a king of kings, as an as a, a basically a um, Argeid as opposed to an Achaemenid lord of Asia. And so from this point, you know, he, he keeps going. Uh, he doesn't stop. He um, subjugates Sogdia. He moves into modern day Afghanistan. Um, you know, all of the regions which were formerly part of the um, the, for, the former Achaemenid Empire and establish, you know, reestablishes the um, the system of satrapies, you know, um, devolved administrations to various laws, which have been, you know, the case with the, um, the Achaemenid Empire. But he goes beyond the Achaemenid Empire and he invades India. And um, at the Battle of um, Hydapsus in 325, he um, defeats King Porus. And, you know, after that point, um, his fervors extend, you know, going all the way into the the modern Indus Valley. Um, there, I believe, there is a mutiny among his men. Yeah, his he's... men refuse to go any further. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> understandable, to be honest. You know, I think I think any other man would have been satisfied, but not Alexander. Um, but yeah, th then we then we begin to see um, internal problems because you mentioned. I mean, I mean, I don't think he set out with this. I don't think he set out from Greece with the notion of becoming, you know, the the new the new Persian king or Persian emperor. But certainly. Um, um, once he's, you know, established in Babylon, which is his new capital, you know, he he um he he takes on more and more Eastern affectations. He gets all of his men. He orders them to marry Persian wives. Yeah. Um, he begins to dress as a Persian. But apparently, um, according to our sources, the the um the decisive moment where his where his men and even the leaders um really begin to resent him is when he begins to dis them demand that the Greeks prostrate themselves because of course oh, the, per yeah. the Persians would um prostrate themselves before the king you know they would lie down with their face on the ground you know and kiss kiss the, the ground the and obviously yes yeah, you know yeah and I, that's I, I, and as and we've seen, this is this is a rejection of all of the constitutional political developments, which have seemed to again either proceed towards a more constitutional, more again, like you could say the closest system, you know, is is like Sparta, where the the king or the two kings have serious checks on their power, or in Athens, where there was no king at all. Um, you can say that this is the complete reversal of that, and you know, no wonder it's going to cause um, friction among the Macedonians because they are being taken essentially as the you can almost say as the 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 elite you know just just under the king and now they're going to be assimilated into one of you can say many uh, provinces of the empire at this point yeah um even though that that doesn't happen the greeks do establish themselves as a ruling caste with various ruling dynasties throughout the period of the diadoshi nevertheless i think this period is incredibly significant because again just my my limited understanding of this that been a strict association with the idea of barbarian as opposed to Greek um, before this period. Um, not only during this period do you have the assimilation of this idea of, you know, Hellenists, you know, a, a, re a real consolidated Greek identity, which is building upon the, um, the again, as we mentioned, the the original inc incarnation of the Greek identity through the Greco-Persian Wars. The next couple of hundred years, we have this creation of the Hellenic identity, but we also have this assimilation to some extent with the barbarian customs as well and this complete radical shift away from again treating the barbarians as uh, again so something which is that their customs are to be entirely abhorred rather than we are going to adopt the customs because it's going to aid in the process of empire building and we're going to adopt their systems of administration rather than imposing our own such as they are yeah and, and, I, and um in in this new um international sort of world that's been created um we we begin to see certain very important ideological developments as well i mean in this new hellenistic east we have um the spread of you know neoplatonism right we have we have neoplatonism um you know the sort of resurgence of of platonic philosophy uh, but now over this, you know, before it was literally restricted to just Athens, really. But now it's mm. spread over this vast geographic area. And we also have um, 
um, um, an incredibly decisive um, development, which which leads on to the birth of our Lord, which is you see the increasing interaction between um, Jewish culture and Jewish tradition and the new um, Hellenistic culture, and you get the the popularity of um, you know uh, sort of Hellenized forms of Judaism amongst them, um, especially, uh, especially in Alexandria, group. as far as I'm aware. Yeah, yeah, in Alexandria, it really takes off. There's there's a surprising um, um, surprisingly large Jewish population in Alexandria at this time. Um, but but yeah yeah so 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 the, um, this conquest lays the foundation for um, um, Eastern Eastern Christendom basically. Marcus, also with uh, as Alexander has become increasingly sort of more power as more powerful, more successful as his campaigns have gone on, and as he's eventually sort of conquered the entirety of the former Achaemenid Empire, and he's ruling in Babylon as, uh, as king of kings. Uh, you mentioned uh, Columba, you made reference, and even AM, you made reference to the increasing degrees of resentment which his fellow Greeks felt towards him as he adopted these more Eastern styles of ruling. And we can't uh, really dismiss the conspiracy against uh, Alexander where he actually uh, accuses uh, Philotas, who was the oh, commander yes. of his companion cavalry. I was cavalry just about to bring this there. up. <laughs> okay. And, um, uh, and, oh, no, what, and what's tragic Continue. is... And what's tragic is of of the men that he inherited off his father, because I mean there were a, a cadre of generals that were his father's generals, and one of them is Parmenion, and Parmenion mm -hmm. was quite renowned for you might say holding the the, the line of the phalanx in, in some of the hardest fought battles, you know, or, or hardest fought portions of the battles, whether Granicus or Issus. Parmenion was quite the hero and quite esteemed amongst the fighting men, and Parmenion was simply implicated on the basis that Philotus was his son. And uh, yeah. and I think I think with the death of Philotus and Parmenion, um, you start to have this brewing resentment that sits underneath those who uh, you know, well, just it's not just Alexander. it's not just death. I'm pretty sure um, the son of Parmenion is tortured. I'm pretty oh, no, sure he's tortured. Is tortured. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, yeah. but where's Parmenion yeah. is just executed. We just I, I, and then yeah. we also um, another another at the Battle of the Granicus, the first battle that Alexander. Um, fought against the persians his first victory um he boldly sort of charged across the the river with the right flank um you know which was a totally unexpected move because the persians um had seen him reinforcing his left and so they they had, they had moved all their forces to the right um so but but anyway enough military terminology but uh and he, so he crosses the river and obviously it's very thick fighting and he's crossed with the cavalry and there's a there's a persian um um nobleman his name's like Spusipes or something like that, and he uh, he raises his sword, and 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 um, the story goes that he he was very close to killing Alexander until Cleitus the Black um, slew, um, sliced the man's arm off and saved Alexander's life. Um, now later on in Babylon, again when these resentments are building, um, they're having a massive party. Um, and there's the, the, there's some sort of argument breaks out, and they're all you know they've had too much to drink, and apparently Alexander picks up a javelin and murders Cletus in, in full view of everyone. And, mm -hmm. and afterwards, he's very remorseful, obviously, but um, this is another mm -hmm. thing which sort of um, sub cements this 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 fear of of the tyrant in his men. They're worried. They, they've not seen him act this way. You know, he's acting with um, um, total abandon, like a Persian king would act. And, and he's you know? and he's becoming more erratic as well. That's the thing yeah, that's yeah. Him. And he's drinking a lot. Yes, exactly. He takes oh. after his father in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> but no, he also, as far as more, he destroys the city of Persepolis as well, which was one of the one of the many Persian capitals. Yeah, he burns um, down the palace. Yeah, and, and I think there's also, I think. Um, Hephaestion, who is his um, lover, because of course um, Alexander was bisexual. Um, they Dine, were, they were friends. They were oh, right. friends. Okay. Uh, again, that that set him, set him off, and you know, added to this this begrudging insanity. Um, there is one question I want to ask, um, which is his married marriage to Roxana. Um, why did he marry Roxana in particular? Because she seems to be quite a minor noble, all things considered. If he had to marry anyone, I honestly could say um perhaps she was just incredibly beautiful it's always it's always hard to judge these things that when we when we don't know details you know like is it a case of you know genuine affection is it a case of expediency is it a case mm. that maybe he was taken away by excessive beauty i think one thing we can interpret accurately from his uh marriage marriage to roxana and the production and you know the, the bearing of, of an heir 
in the form of um, you know his son Alexander, is the desire to create a, a, a Greco-Persian dynasty to rule yes. this 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 vast Greco-Persian yeah. empire. Which is I think say, the... knowing knowing Alexander's personality yeah. or from what we know about it, um, I would say I would say that the possibility of be, him being carried off by love for some beautiful girl not impossible, not imppossible. Mm. That's, that's what I mean. It could be sort of elements of all of the above. You know what I mean? So we just, we, just, yeah. we just can't speak authoritatively because we just don't know. We have no way of knowing. And I think this, you know, sets up the next point, which of course he dies prematurely in his thirties in the year three two three, and the result of this is that his son, I believe, is only one or two years old when he dies, and um, there are disputes over you know his death. But I believe the last words Alexander the Great said when he's you know discussing the possibility of a regency is that he would leave it to the strongest and then dies yes. basically you know almost fermenting this you know conflict between all of his various Oof. generals who survived mm. up until this point and you know roxana isn't powerful enough and she's not greek so she's not in a position where she can establish a regency in her own right so um originally there is a a regency set up by you know among many sort of ambitious generals one of the first is um uh Peridikas. and um he's I think very quickly murdered a couple of yeah, years later. Yeah, within like a year. Yes, within a murder. Uh, and um, this well, sets off the. Yeah, he has a failed expedition to Egypt to pacify Ptolemy, and then that sort of triggers off the other Diadochi splintering off. Yes, and I think in terms of understanding, you know, why the splintering of the empire occurs, of course, all of the, you know, most of the original satraps, the Achaemenid satraps, have been replaced by invariably many of um, Alexander's generals. And those generals, as you mentioned, Ptolemy, you know, the satrap of Egypt, would then be in a position to consolidate their own, you know, power centers. So when, you know, therefore the creation of kingdoms as the central, the central authority, you know, dwindles, you know, exponentially from 322 until 301, it's very natural that these rulers such as Ptolemy or Seleucus or, um, again it becomes more complicated when it comes to Macedon because Macedon would um switch many times you know first it would be to um I believe it's Antipater or no he yes, would control and then, Anatolia um, and then um, and, no I think it was Cassander. him and then, no, Cassander yeah, then would murder Cassander, yeah. Cassander would murder Alexander Cassander. wouldn't he uh, yes. And again, this puts an end to the idea of any unity when um, Cassander, who's one of the Diadochi, a Diadochian Greek just means successor, um, murders um, Alexander in 309 when he achieves his um, majority, rather than submit himself to the rule of the, the last Argiad king. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this really, you know, puts an end to the idea that there is any sort of residual unity in the mm -hmm. empire when you have the murder of Alexander's only son and heir. And, you know, very soon after, I believe, you know, Cassander himself is... Um, I believe he's murdered by Ptolemy the Thunderbolt, or is that that's later on? Is that um, Lysimachus who removes Cassandra? I think anyway. it's Lysimachus. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's Lysimachus. But but what's interesting is that um because we did mention Issus, and one interesting uh, fact from the from the Battle of Issus is that the the actual survivors of the battle do actually um take refuge in the interior of Anatolia in sort of what's one day Cappadocia, and they attempt to cut. Alexander's supply lines, but they are defeated by a certain Antigonus Monothalmos, um, who would become the, he was the satrap of, or, you know, the Macedonian governor of Phrygia, and Antigonus would become a major player in these Didoki wars. Now, he uh, and his son Demetrius are defeated against a coalition of all the other Didoki, and, and, uh, and Antiochus is killed in battle, but his son Demetrius survives. And how Demetrius actually comes to claim the the, the throne in, in Macedon is he, he basically says that us Antiochids, or my, myself and my father, were the only defenders of Alexander's legacy. Cassander and his family killed the son of the king. Yes, and that's exactly. How, and that's how Demetrius and his uh, and his successors, you know, like um, uh, Gonatas and so on, ha um, the Antigonids gain power in continental Greece as a result. Yes, and they of hold that. on to power as far as I'm aware until um, until the Romans uh, arrive. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, so, because so, yeah, uh, Philip and Perseus are the are the descendants of Antigonus mm -hmm. by direct. And, and it is um it is interesting because we were talking earlier on about the importance of um you know certain infrastructure being built up in in areas and when you when you look at how how the empire is split amongst the successors and um, it does pretty much come down to to that to that kind of infrastructure you know because um anatolia becomes sort of um you know separate which makes sense because we've had you know the kingdoms of lydia uh, yes. and, and independent kingdoms there it's it's sort of a self-contained area then we have uh, macedon and greece and then we have egypt and then we have um what basically the 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 persian empire yeah uh, seleucia um, and, and this yeah, is quite under, significant under um, the, the two power structures of course from the seleucids are going to be um 
one in near Babylon, which is the city of Seleucia, but another one which is near Antioch, which is going to be the, the new center of a Hellenic culture in Syria, as right. Alexandria is the center of a new Hellenic culture in Egypt at the same time. And, you know, of all the successor empires, you could probably say the Seleucid Empire um, corresponds to, uh, again, I'll, I'll get this image up because I have an image, but I forgot to utilize it. So I just get it up quickly there. Um, you can see that the Seleucid Empire, you know, and that's before the, um, the the conquest of much of um, Anatolia by yeah. the Seleucids as well. So the Seleucid Empire is actually ends up being bigger than that. Um, it, it does consolidate the vast majority of Alexander's legacy until it begins to splinter. I believe it's in the second century BC when you would have the Bactrian kingdom split off and the um, the Greater yeah. Indian kingdom split off. And of course, eventually the Parthians would arrive and um, yes. take up the mantle of um, some form of restoration of um, yeah, things become sort of increasingly. Rule things become sort of increasingly Easternized, you know? I mean, you can even track it in the art. If you look at the early art of um, of, of the Seleucid Empire, it's, you know, extremely Greek, you know? It, it is Greek, it's, it's perfectly Greek art, but give it a couple hundred years um, of ruling over the East and you see, um, you see the art forms begin to, I guess, break down and they become um, more comparable to um the art of you know the persian empire that came before it you know it, it's really interesting to see so uh yeah the greek um dominance um wanes over time you know and then by the time it's become um <laughs> very, very very weak indeed and things are very um very unstable for a number of reasons the romans come in yes and, and just moving on the so, sorry marcus just one point just building on that sure, specific sure, point sure. that marcus uh, sorry at columba brought up which is the easternization of the empire of course, we mentioned that Athens during the classical period, during the fifth century, was the center of Greek culture. Of course, the center of Greek culture also moves east during this point, and it really centers in Alexandria. You know, the Ptolemies of all the dynasties are the greatest patrons of the arts and learning. And again, this not only becomes the the center of the great library of Alexandria, which will be the you know attempt <laughs> sorry um, to assemble all of these um again works by greek authors in one setting for the first time but also it will be the home of this uh, neoplatonic um, revival as well so it'll be the the beating heart of you know literature and philosophy in greece and also the sciences as well i believe um aristophanes who would um calculate the circumference of the earth accurately in the second century bc was um from Alexandria. So um, again, talking about the Easternization of the empire is just paradoxical to us thinking that the center of the Hellenic civilization is going to move to Egypt of all places, but it does. And it yes, becomes the largest city in the world at this time. Oh, there's some remarkable things. Yeah, if anyone's ever bored, you could look up um, Hiero of Alexandria. He was a, he was a sort of um, you know, philosopher slash scientist. Apparently he built a um, a steam-powered bird which could fly. <laughs> just, I was like, wait a minute. So you have steam power and flight, you know, and neither of these things were capitalized on. But what can you do? What can you do? Anyway, Marcus, I interrupted your point. No, 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 no. That was that was all wor well worthwhile. Um, all I was going to say is uh, they're not really on this map. There's only a couple of them, but we have to appreciate too that the Greeks almost pioneer something which the romans would later master with the colonne system and over the course of throughout the entirety of these realms of the of of antigonos of ptolemy of ptolemy and of course Seleucus in the east there's upwards of 16 alexandrias which are built across yes. um alexander's realm and not just those 16 alexandrias because i mean the furthest being alexander escate which is Literally alexandria alexander most furthest, east yeah exactly exactly um up in between uh sort of bordering battery and sogdia up in the north um is that th there are other cities also which have significantly transplanted greek populations uh, for instance with what we know as the city of antioch but not far from that the antigonids actually founded a city called antigonea and mm. the these large bodies of sort of greek colonies which were drawn from old greece you know from from thessaly from macedon maybe even uh, settlers from southern greece would have moved as well but these populations were used as a uh, essentially as like a manpower pool for the likes of antigonos and seleucus and ptolemy to to field armies but as as uh, as alexander also found out when he sort of got sorry to the Marcus, Indus, was... hello yes you're cutting out a little bit oh yes, sorry I can hear most of you um that the, the 
even Alexander found it towards the end of his campaigns, he was unable to reinforce his armies with exclusively Greek soldiers yeah. and would have to in se- essentially incorporate Persians and Easterners into his army. And so when you look at the, the, the phalanxes and the armies that were assembled by the likes of Antiochus and, and Seleucus, they, they were sort of the, a combination of Greeks and Persians. And it was a mix of having these settler cities with predominantly Greek populations along with levying locals and sort of making that work into a military system and that along with these military colonies of Greeks you also had small little flourishings of 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 Greek philosophy of Greek artwork of yeah. of, of the arts as Columbus stated most um most energetically pi- uh, uh, patronized by the Ptolemy dynasty um and these population pockets had a significant effect in Hellenizing a large part of the Near East. And this Hellenization process leaves a mark up until even the Crusader period. Like there are pockets of Greek Christians in the Levant up until the Crusades. Yeah, I mean there, there are some there are some fascinating developments when you consider it. And I mentioned, you know, the blending of Eastern art and Western art and and one of the most powerful that one one um you know during this Hellenistic period, um a kingdom off in the far flung east next to um not far you know part partly in India. Um, was called the kingdom of Gandhara, right? And it was a it was a Greco Bactrian sort of kingdom. And here we see um, the blending of Indian and Greek art. And and out of this blending of Indian and Greek art came the depiction of the Buddha that we all know. You know that that yes. depiction of Buddha is 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 um, a descendant of Greek art, which which Absolutely. is you know shocking but also obvious once you see it, right? Um, so so yeah, the, the the impact of this on on world history c- cannot be um, um, under understated or overstated rather. Yes, and I think um, this is you know quite a wonderful way to end the discussion because of course moving on from this point, these kingdoms will invariably be involved in the the fate of the Roman conquest, which is going to be our discussion for next time. So please tune in. Um, next week for that and we'll be starting that talking about the Pyrrhic Wars which we mentioned at the beginning of the stream we'll get back to you which is the the first major military clash between the um the Greeks and the Romans um so thank you both um Columba and Marcus I do have a a, a little thing so I keep forgetting to to shill at the end so I did this to remind me um, oh nice <laughs> um so thank you um very much Marcus and Columba for that um anything to shill um, I have an article um, on my Substack coming out this week on Boethius. So if you are interested in learning a little bit about him, um, it's going to be called Lessons from Lady Philosophy, and it might be a might be a little series. Who knows? Um, to help us get through this this dire time. Absolutely, Marcus. Uh, no, same same situation as usual. Just uh, if you fancy following, feel free to follow. Otherwise, I'm just here evidently on a weekly basis and enjoying it so far so happy to contribute and uh thank you all for um hung, having hung around and uh, listened it's been a pleasure yeah. thank you wonderful and i'll just reiterate what's said on the ad you know thank you everyone for watching if you enjoyed this discussion please like share and subscribe if you like the sort of content then you know consider donating through subscribe star which is linked in the description so thank you everyone for watching thank you columba and marcus for being such stellar guests and good night. And just a quick reminder that this series will be returning next week on Monday. And we will be having a complimentary series to this at Wednesday at 9 p.m. GMT, which is going to be discussing the historicity of the Homeric epics. And we're going to have Columba on there. And yes, I'm very much <laughs> looking forward to that. So good night. <laughs>